What say you all? That we dive into chapter four. Pig and Bana. Ooh, the background's lit now. Four of these, seven? It looks like seven here. I don't see an eighth candle. Have been lit. And now there's enough light to see around the hallway. That's cool. Or at least to see several things in front of us and the hallway itself. I like the changing menu here. They did something similar with uh, Umineko, where the menu changed when you beat the game. Or when you beat the chapters, sorry. And then obviously when you beat the game, because the game's another chapter. Uh, but this is interesting. It's slowly lighting up the menu, revealing more and more of what's going on. And we got like uh, a school hallway, it looks like. No, there's too much detail. This might be a home. There's like some, there's like a small table here or a surface here. And there's like details on the walls. This doesn't look like a school hallway. Or too long to be a house. Weird. Mansion? Anyway, chapter four, Shrine of the Guardian Deity. I assume the eyes are uh, getting Bonos. After school. That is a cheap roof if I've, ever, if I've ever seen one. It's like sheet metal. A sheet metal roof over something? Lord, I guess. A bike stand? Uh, where they... Uh, the place they put the garbage, uh... Like the garbage dumpster? Maybe? Since it had been raining heavily until recently, not a single kid could be seen playing in the, the courtyard. The girl changed from her slippers into her shoes by the entrance. Since there was a committee meeting today, it was late when she started leaving school. As far as we can see from here, it seems the rain has stopped, or perhaps it was still raining just a little bit. The girl, while hesitantly or hesitating on whether to hold up her umbrella, moved out from under the eaves and looked up at the sky. We're probably being introduced to a new person here? Who's it gonna be? Dull weather, the color of lead. And a chair. Splat! Oh, wow. In a puddle, something dark red began to spread. What? Tana did? You're kidding, right? I heard a chair fell on her. Straight out of nowhere. They say with a difference of a few centimeters, it would have crushed her eyes. The next day, her class was in an uproar. For the average, ever-repeating daily routine that was their school lives, a big incident... Like one of their classmates being injured and hospitalized almost never happened. Someone dropped a chair on her? From like the second or third story? They were all excited about this turn of events and they continued talking without end. However, injured girl's friends were whispering about the incident off to the side. This is bad, isn't it? You're worrying too much. Don't be stupid. For a chair or something to come falling down? It's not uncommon. I mean, maybe it was some distressed upperclassman who tossed the chair out the window by chance? There's no way something like that would happen. I thought so. Maybe it's that curse. No way. <laughs> One of them began convulsing with laughter. I'd like to point out that of the three things we've had, we've only, uh... We didn't have the third one actually be about... We, had, we met the chairman in part two, and he's sort of like the first, or not chairman, but like, he's sort of like the head of the, uh, the yokai, but this guy is sort of the shadow second? We don't know if he's actually second among, he, he's not second among the school yokai, so we didn't actually meet uh, a new member of the school yokai. Although he is a school spirit, he's not one of the eight. So we aren't meeting a new person. We aren't meeting a new school yokai on the council every single chapter. We are meeting a new yokai every chapter, but we aren't meeting a new member of the council every chapter. That was what the previous chapter told us. One of them began convulsing with laughter. As if reaching the same conclusion, the other girls wiped the grim expressions from their faces and joined in on the laughter. 
You know, since that day, nothing but strange things have happened. Didn't I tell you? A pebble came flying at me. Someone must be pulling a practical joke. Or are you saying it's the work of a Tengu? Don't forget the curse of the guardian spirit. A girl with an eye patch popped out and muttered this. Shut up, no one asked for your opinion. Go somewhere else, emo girl. As the leader of the girls uncomfortably gets up to leave, the other girls look at each other and take their leave, one after another. Afterwards, the girl with the eye patch was all that was left. The girl's name? Michiru Sakurada. As indicated by the gloomy atmosphere, she has no friends. Always alone and reading complicated books, she'd mutter to herself. If you asked your classmates about her, they'd tell her she stands out or she's a dangerous one. But as far as Michiru is concerned, she wasn't entirely off target. Michiru heads to the back of the school building alone, and she goes to the forgotten flower bed overgrown with weeds. And there is a tiny shrine of weathered wood. It's difficult to tell if the shrine that's been covered with in grit from wind and rain was being maintained or not. However, its age certainly lends it a sense of serenity. Michiru leaned in front of it and lightly clapped her hands, praying, Guardian so Spirit Sama, Guardian, Guardian Spirit Sama, somehow stop the festival. As she whispered this in a low voice countless times, she'd look up at the shrine and repeat her prayer. The shrine's small wooden doors that housed the object of worship had been broken. Although crushed from its raised splinters, one can imagine it was broken just recently. There's hardly any children who play ball behind the school. It might be possible that a heavy ball came flying, crashed into the doors, and demolished them. Standing up straight, Michiru caressed those doors, acting as if she was trying to repair the damage done to them. However, there's no way that would fix it. Tragically demolished, the shrine had been neglected. Who's there? Michiru stood up suddenly and slowly looked behind her. When she did, from the shadow of the tool shed, a girl flinched in startlement. The girl was one of the friends of the injured girl. She was one of the girls Michiru had warned about the curse. G good afternoon. Good afternoon. The girl bowed timidly. As far as life at school goes, students almost never say good afternoon to each other. The awkward greeting suggests these two haven't been making regular exchanges every day. Without even blinking, Michiru stood up and stared directly into the girl's eyes. The girl decides she's ready and walks out from undercover. Uh, uh, about earlier, uh, I'm sorry. Hiromi is, well, a, a bit of a sharp tongue, you see. It's fine. I'm not worried about it at all. Michiru says and turns back again to the shrine. The girl also looked at the shrine over Michiru's shoulder and swallowed with a gulp. Hey, Sakurada-san? Well, you have, you know... Have what? A sixth sense or something? After Michiru let out a short sigh, she slowly turned around. And she seemed to wordlessly inquire, If I did, would you believe it? I said I did. So the girl, unable to understand the silence, began cringing. Kids in class were spread rumors about it. They say, well, you have something like a sixth sense. They say a sixth sense means you can see them. I can't see them at all, but that's... Oh, all right. <laughs> After letting out another short sigh, Michiru spoke. For me, it's been a very natural sight. Because I can see them, everyone else must be seeing them too. I believe that since I was a child. When I first entered elementary school, I finally realized it. I was seeing what no one else could. Even now, does that mean you're seeing them? Michiru was silent, but her gaze wandered. It was as if an insect or something similar had darted out, and her eyes were simply following it. But there was nothing there. The focal point of Michiru's gaze slowly neared the girl. Unable to stand it, the girl covered her head. Michiru looked at her and giggled. I'm joking. Not like I could always see them. Rather, only if I want to. So I made, a spe I made an effort to stop seeing them. 
thanks to that, as long as I'm conscious, I almost never see them. Why stop seeing them? By chance, even if I see someone possessed by a spirit, there's nothing I can do. If I tell someone to be careful of being possessed by a spirit, who'd believe me? That's, that's, that's quite reasonable, I think. Having a unique ability alter yourself doesn't mean it's always a good thing, much less sensing other misfortunes with that ability. Furthermore, being unable to tell them about it. Uh, well, I definitely won't make fun of you, because I believe you. Uh, would you tell me? About the shrine to the guardian spirit you broke? Yeah. Is Kana's injury a curse after all? That's right. So, so the question is, can she see or is she a Chuni? Probably the part, probably Chuni, right? Probably just Chuni. The girl swallowed with a gulp once more. Something foul runs in the veins of the earth around here. Evil intents, bad spirits. Those sort of things have a tendency to gather around this ground. It kind of curses one of those bad spirits? No. The guardian spirit came here and used this shrine to calm the evil forces and wicked spirits long, long ago. Even after the people who honored him were gone, he remained for ages and ages, continuing to protect this land. The spirit was lonely. During these good times, even though he's protecting this land, he received no thanks. Because of this, I'm sure that the spirit might have had times when even he would sulk. But since we hit it with the ball and broke it? That's right. The guardian spirit became angry. It's not like only you were in the wrong. In the midst of these good months and years, the shrine was left alone and not honored that built up for many generations. When you broke the shrine, the accumulation came bursting forth. Guardian spirits curse? Yes. The Guardian Spirit's incredibly angry now. How are we supposed to call them? The best thing to do would have been for all of you to apologize to the shrine the moment you broke it with the ball. If you did that, the Guardian Spirit would likely have been able to see it as a simple coincidental accident. When the girls were playing with the ball, by chance, Michiru was also there, and she saw the girls broke the shrine. Warning them if they didn't apologize at the shrine, something terrible would happen. But they ridiculed the thought of something so stupid and left it that way. And so the guardian spirits become encompassed in rage and the humans' disrespect. We haven't actually encountered any guardian spirits. If anything, the closest is uh, Miso Miso Chan. If you listen to my warning, nobody would experience this misfortune. Uh, I'm sorry. At the time, we were just in a panic. We just... It's fine. At the very least, the Guardian Spirits received your feelings of reverence. That will become the first step towards quelling its rage. Please, sakurata uh, I'm scared. Not should have the accident with the chair. Hiromi Wakata, everyone around them. Something strange is happening to them. At first, I wondered if maybe it was just someone pulling my leg. But then things got worse and worse. Finally, the chair? If this curse gets any worse than this, what will happen to us? What's gonna happen? I'm scared. Save us, Sakura! As the girl became more pale, tears welled up in her eyes and she pleaded. Because of her power, the eerie Michiru, who was always distant from her classmates, was being relied upon only when it became convenient for them, and it wasn't a pleasant feeling. You think it's Miruko-chan Chuni? That seems so unlikely. However, she may have just grasped her first chance. However, our chance, she might be able to save someone with her own power. Michiru sighed, Michiru sighed for the upteenth time as she gazed at the girl, preparing herself for the worst. I can't do much. First off, I can't quell the guardian spirit's rage. Oh, who can appease it? Uh, the only who can do that are all of, all of you. I mean, it was the truth. She was dumbfounded and she swallowed a gulp. Gather all who were playing ball that day in front of the shrine, and if you all apologize, maybe they'll do something? All of us? Yes. All of you. Even if you apologize on your own, it's likely that alone will not reach the guardian spirit. Think of it like rope. The power of your hearts are weak one by one, but when tied together, they become strong. Yes. 
What you can do is convince everyone and bring them here. What I can do is teach you how to pay your respects at the shrine. And I can protect you until the day you do. Convincing everyone and bringing them here. Not an easy task. It could take days. The leader type Hiromi reacted into talk of these events being tied to the occult's bad, uh, bad out flat rejection, calling the idea stupid. Convincing her would be no simple matter. Kana is still in the hospital after being injured by the chair. They say she's not in serious condition, but they don't know when she'll be able to leave. Entering the next few days, there's no guarantee the curse won't strike again. You're right. Even while I'm trying to convince everyone, the curse might happen again. The next curse, this time, someone might die. I don't want that. I don't want a classroom filled with chrysanthemums. Hang on, this is no laughing matter. The girl made an expression as if not knowing whether to laugh or to cry and grabbed hold of Michiru's shoulder. Well, let me see if there is, I think there was a hotkey for this. To actually read the gold text right away, let me see. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Nope, nope, nope. The launch is available in-game in an external RTF file. Oh, that's handy. Hold up. I wonder if I can open that. Is that what is an RTF open with? Okay. Uh, chrysanthemums. Here we go. Chrysanthemums in Japanese culture, especially if they are white or yellow, are used at wakes and funerals, especially usually for bereavement purposes. I understood that, but you specified the class room. In Chapter 4 of Higginbana, Michiru is implying there may end up being a potential memorial service in the classroom should anyone end up dying from the Guardian Deities curse. That's the classroom filled with chrysanthemums. I see. I was just wondering if there was something specific, like if they put uh, Chris hung chrysanthemums when someone died in the class. Interesting. Okay. Uh, there's your uh, weekly Japanese trivia. A good reference. A good reference. You could have. You kind of get the impression that's what it is from the use of flowers. But the specificity is unique, is uh, interesting. Anyway, until you have all gathered here, we have to make it so the guardian spirit doesn't cast his spell again. Isn't there anything? Like a charm? A talisman? Something? There is, but the guardian spirit's very strong. Of course he is. Something like that can't protect you. Oh, I do. I'll definitely convince everyone. I'll bring them here. Until they come, we protect ourselves from the curse. With her hair blowing in the wind, Michiru looked to the shrine and then looked up at the large school. The guardian spirit's the local deity of these grounds. Protect against his curse. Borrow similar power from those that live on these grounds. Uh, okay. What if I do? What do you do indeed? With a weird ass puny giving you some bad ritual advice. Moonlight illuminates the school in the dark night. The cries of the insects further add to the stillness. The silhouettes of two people stood behind the old school building, of course. If our teachers see those doing something, we'll be in big trouble, won't we? If you think suffering a curse is better, you should go back. I'll do it! I'll, I'll do it! The girl struck the glass of one of the windows with a large stone. After a few times, cracks like a spider web ran across the glass and a fist-sized hole opened up. Seriously, we're breaking a school window? What for? While Michiru cast a light on it with a flashlight, the girl reached inside the hole and unlocked the door. We're breaking into the school, but why? Oh, it's the old school building. We're safe. No one's gonna look. And then the two stepped into the old school building. About the old building. It's haunted, isn't it? Talking about that, eh? Well, we're uh, not really alone. Right, can you see any of them crawling about this place? You want to know what I see? If you want, I can tell you. Never mind. Inconvenient, right? No one calls your bluff. 
There's probably nothing to be seen, and she's just, like, bluffing super hard. In a school where a lot of people gather, there's a lot of memories, spirits, and power gathers there. Because of that, over many long years, this old building has become the strongest of all. Can that power really protect me? Depends on your intentions. If you don't have respect for the... If you have respect for the various powers and have a heart that wishes to be granted protection, they'll surely give that to you. Yes. That's the wish. That's what I want. Here. Prayer beads. Take them. Good. Good. Here's a protective charm. You just ward off evil spirits. They'll bring good spirits to you. Holding prayer beads, charms, and flashlights, it began walking through the old school building at night. Ichiru was chanting some strange spell, or perhaps a Shinto prayer? Nobody knows what she's saying. The girl couldn't understand it, but those words seemed like they were intended to seek protection from the spirits that live in the old building. She couldn't understand it at all, but she tried to follow along, and like Michiro, she started chanting as well. I wonder, are our voices really reaching the spirits? Yeah, they're here. They're really close, they're watching us. <laughs> Michiro wasn't telling a lie with those words, because an otherworldly being really was there, and it was watching the two girls. You too? What are you up to at this hour? It was the subject of the old school building's ghost story, Meso Meso Marie, of the eighth ghost story. Rarely are there students who test their courage by creeping in here. Students coming in here this late are particularly rare. Marie, worrying the girls might tumble in the darkness and get themselves hurt, walked alongside them. In reality, the inside of the old school building was full of low-class spirits and yokai. Their strength amplified by the night, they wait here and there, looking to harm these rare visitors by making them get caught on things or by causing them to trip and fall. However, when they see Marie, school yokai of the 8th rank, they jump and run at a sight. To them, the 8th rank school yokai was a terrifying creature. Just by walking alongside them, Marie had the effect of a great talisman against evil spirits. Our spirits of the former school building, for just a short time, granted me protection from the guardian spirit. I kicked the ball in the shrine and broke it. I, I ran away. I must do the ritual and apologize to my friends. Please forgive me. Marie had been listening to the girl's story for some time. But Marie learned that the girl tapped into some creature's rage, suffered a curse, and one of her friends had already been injured. She didn't exactly understand the circumstances, but resenting someone and hurting them because they kicked a ball, thinking some like th something like that lived in the school, somewhat angered Marie. Please, spirits of the former school building. Protect me! Alright, I understand. I'm not really a spirit, but I'll grant your wish. Marie clenched her fist and gave a strong nod. The shrine spirit had to be pretty important to be cursing people, almost like it's not a real spirit. I can understand it getting mad that its home was destroyed, but thinking about it, it's saying it wants everyone to gather and apologize? I can forgive it for having those kinds of feelings. I haven't met this yokai called the Guardian Spirit, but since it's something that lives on the same school grounds I do, it should listen to what I have to say. Assuming it's real. The next day, goons are go go going around having fun during recess. Marie appeared behind the school building in her human-like form. I'm sure they said it was around here, but being honest, Marie didn't even know... That shrine existed. The school's vast and gigantic. There was nothing unusual about going to a place she didn't know about. Then came a clang and a tap. She heard the sound of someone hitting metal. When she moved closer to see what was going on, in a corner of the thickly overgrown weeds, there was the shrine. There was someone in a teacher's white coat crouched there, and she was doing something. Uh, <clears throat> Good afternoon. So that she could communicate with this human, Marie adjusted her own wavelength to match the woman's. Mm -hmm. What's wrong? Are you hurt? The one who turned around, surprisingly, was the infirmary nurse. Perhaps she had a hobby as a weekend carpenter. By looking at the shrine, it was apparent she'd taken off the gates and was now repairing the hinges. What are you doing? Well, you see, the bugs make a lot of noise. Bugs make a lot of noise? <laughs> well, perhaps that's just my sixth sense. It bothered me for some reason, and I went out to look, right? The shrine's gates were broken. A ball or something must have crashed into it, and I thought about the poor spirit in the shrine, you know? If you can, 
Look at this. Look at it this way. As a nurse, mending's my forte. She said this as she laughed and skillfully continued repairing the gates. It seems the nurse consents us. They can bond some? Once in a while, there is one, you see. A human who consents us, that is. At times, she's noticed my presence. She's always been by my side, or perhaps some of my magic rubbed off on her. <laughs> the school nurse's sixth sense must have led her to perceive the rage of the shrine's master. Note that that is not dialogue. Oh, then she came here and found the shrine was broken. This is, seems to be... Uh, I think the quote ended. Or did it? No, she laughed and that's the end. She came here and found the shrine was broken. Someone's living in this shrine, right? Hell no? Yes, someone does? Oh, okay. Their home was broken, so it's been problematic. It must be quite angry. Uh, wouldn't you? Suddenly having your home broken? I don't think there's a person out there who wouldn't be upset. It was an exceedingly obvious story. I was half expecting Higginbond to be like, hell nah. Or not half expecting, I was kind of expecting that. That would make, that'd be kind of funny to have like a twist where there's no spirit involved and it's just one person. Anyway, the girls didn't have long to gather and come apologize. So before their time runs out, they had no choice but to ask someone to hold off the curse. According to what I heard from the girl's story, it seemed this presence held considerably strong spiritual power. I bet it's high ranked. I wonder if we'd listen to this tireless 8th ranked yokai story. What's the matter, Marie? She's gotten quiet. Uh, the truth is... Marie explained the situation. It seemed it was quite a sudden story for Higginbana. The master of this shrine seriously injured a girl by his curse out of rage? Yes. The master of this shrine got angry and with a curse. Higginbana said the same thing again, alternating her gaze between the shrine and Marie. Higginbana doesn't even believe it. Did you do that? <laughs> yeah. I wasn't expecting Soktaro! I didn't do anything like that! Yeah, of course, Soktaro wouldn't do that! It was, it was pretty obvious that it was, I was, I'm still thinking like, there's no way this is real, right? Like, no way the shrine spirit actually just goes around hurting people in broad daylight. It's, it's such a big setup for, it's such a big setup for the Chuni to be like suddenly relevant. Like, they do something that could theoretically anchor a spirit. She makes them feel like they're actually doing so, that they're, they're cursed and bad things are happening. Which makes them go to her so she feels relevant, right? And needed? That's that's what the Chuni is pushing for. That's what my plan was. And it makes so much it makes so much sense that it's like this. Yeah. Okay. So so my initial thought was correct. It's a power play from the Chuni to appear more relevant and uh, knowledgeable than her peers. Okay. What? With a popping sound, while raising a cloud of dust, a small boy jumped out at their feet. He was about one head shorter than Marie. He had ears that made one think of a fox or something. Lion. Lion. He didn't seem one tiny bit like one would call a stern guardian spirit. If she had to say, he looked more like an adorable boy. I wouldn't do that. I never hurt anyone. That's so mean. So mean, are you? What? What? Marie was flustered by his sulking gestures and protests. More so, she'd been imagining a terrifying appearance, but... Who is that? Well, this is the animal spirit who lives in this shrine, Sakunoshin. It's not Saktaro, it's Sakunoshin. My name is Sakunoshin. Who are you? Sakunoshin? <laughs> Good afternoon. I'm Marie. They quickly bowed their head and greeted each other. This kid's the leader of the animal spirits at the school. As you can see, he's quite remarkable. Who are you? I'm the king of the animals. Of course, he's a lion. I'm a lion! Hey! A lion? I thought for sure you were a fox or something. That's 
so mean, even though I'm a lion. It's a vegetarian lion too, right? This time he began crying loudly. The way his emotions fluctuated so ac ac acutely, it was almost like a kindergartner's. He suddenly had a ball come flying which broke his precious home. It surprised him and frightened him, so he's been scared away for a while now. He might have been upset, but until a little while ago, he had been hiding and trembling under the bed in the school infirmary. I was it shivering! <laughs> Back in oceans, very easily, a very easily frightened child. So even if we suppose he's the boss around here, he should at least bulk up and be more prepared. But, 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 I was just gonna have a warm nap and suddenly a ball came, bam, crash screech. <laughs> Yes, there, there. You were pretty scared, weren't you? Sort of like this, Marie. What on earth kind of curse could the child have done? You really aren't cursing anybody? I don't know anything about it. Are you, are you? And that should do it. There, all better. The school nurse stood up while dusting off her hands. Rather than just a provisional fix-up, a new door had been installed, and Sakunoshin's house had new doors to close again. Look, look, your house is all better now. Yay! Thank you, Sensei! Who are you? The crying raven finally... Raven? What? Finally laughed. It was quite the accurate saying. Oh, oh, okay, it's a... It's a saying. Alright, that makes sense. Second Ocean was jumping up and down in delight. While seeing such an innocent display, it was clear this child couldn't possibly curse or harm anyone. However, there was a curse. Many things were happening to the girls who hit the shrine with the ball that were beyond explanation. But then the chair fell. Like anyone can't just drop a chair off the top of the building. Wait, listen, hero me? You're gonna act stupid, I'm not going to. Curses? There's no way it's something like that. What happened to Kana was just an accident. But we still don't know the culprit, right? Just because you don't know who the culprit is, you figure it's a curse? What kind of crap is your brain even made out of? I don't believe in curses, never have, never will. I mean, they are kind of real in this setting. See you. I gotta go to club now. Wait, Hiromi! Hiromi rudely st stormed from the classroom, her heels clicking. The girls were bewildered and hung their heads in shame. Other than Hiromi, everyone had agreed it was a curse and settled on going to the shrine and apologizing. Michiru softly came closer to the ring of friends. Was it no good? Yes. I'll definitely persuade her. If I don't, the guardian spirit will curse someone again. That is, if if that someone isn't Hiromi-chan, though. Right. We have to convince her for her own sake. Go do that. Uh, I'm going home. Chiru also left the classroom, and the girls continued speaking in the classroom after school. The unexplainable things that had happened to the girls all happened when they were alone. Nobody wanted to be alone when going home. Except for Michiru, who just stormed off. Or no, Hiromi, who just stormed off. Hiromi's that way, but we have to convince Kana, too. We went to visit her yesterday. Kana also said it could be a curse and wanted to purify it. In that case, if we invite her, she'll definitely come to the shrine. Goodness. Also, they said she's not hospitalized because of her injuries, but because she actually had appendicitis. Once she received medical care at the hospital, suddenly her stomach started to hurt and stuff. Appendicitis? Wait, it doesn't have anything to do with the chair? They said her hinge head injury was just a graze. Uh, is that so? Well, thank goodness. That just leaves Hiromi, right? It'd be nice if Hiromi could change how she feels before the curse falls on her too, but if we don't do something fast, it might be too late. No, no. It's time a fire extinguisher or something could fall. I, I can't handle it if someone dies this time. Until the teacher doing his rounds yelled at them to go home, the girls talked there for ages. Right? They're hinting more and more that it's a person doing this. Now her head's- now she wasn't actually seriously injured. She had appendicitis. Which clearly isn't a curse. Then the sky was dyed scarlet. The crows flocked together from their nesting place and flew to go back home. Hiromi, whose club meeting had finished, was also at the entrance changing her shoes. She was alone at the entrance. Oh boy, here we go. School building fell deathly silent and was Slightly eerie. Kana, le Kana left due, due to the late due to the student council meeting. And when she went home alone, there she was hit by a falling chair. 
I've only talked big, but if there was a curse, it would be awful. Hiromi was trembling slightly. She put on a show in front of everyone, but she was truly scared. Even though she was reluctant to meet with everyone at the shrine, she also wondered if it would be best to go and apologize. Hiromi was so afraid she couldn't leave the entrance. The moment she walked out from under the eaves, maybe something from above? Maybe something more lethal would come falling down on her. The thought frightened her. Since I'm acting tough, maybe, maybe it won't be a chair. It could be a fire extinguisher or something instead. If that happened, it would be fatal this time. A grind? That sound had no way to reach Hiromi's ears. Because that sound was immediately outside the entrance and far overheard. Far overheard or overhead? And it was from inside the veranda off the third floor classroom. What it was did not betray her imagination. A little bit sooty and rusted, it was a deep red and extremely heavy fire extinguisher. It went on grinding, scraping, dragging across the concrete of the veranda's alcove. Hiromi dismissed the worst possible situation with a laugh, thinking it to be absurd. With a bitter smile, she slowly began to walk. One step. Two steps. Three steps. If she walks a few more steps, she'd leave the entrance. She heads out under the eaves. And then slowly, the fire extinguisher was lifted. The clunky hunk of metal waited for Hiromi's form to appear. Let's stop this. Cheer, Sakurada-san. The voice was abrupt. He didn't sense its presence, however, when Michiru slowly turned, there was a f there certainly was a figure of a person. It was Marie, surprising nobody. It was the Chuni all along. Below her, Hiromi was running full speed towards the school gate. She was already far, far away from the entrance. Now, if she dropped the fire extinguisher, Hiromi wouldn't even notice it. Ichiro knew she had lost her chance and dropped the heavy mass with a thump. Tell me, why are you doing these things? You're not a yokai. Much less someone who can curse or pass judgment on anyone. But... Ichiro clenched her fists tightly and while slightly trembling, she hung her head. And then as tears began to spill out, she screamed. Nobody would believe me! No one believed her. Since she was born, she had the strange power known as a sixth sense. But no one believed that. Feeling alienated and alone, she couldn't trust anybody. Though she was always alone. When the shrine broke, I, I know I felt it. Something with strong power, something extremely sorrowful and astonishing. I'm sure I received those violent feelings. That's why I told them. They didn't apologize, the curse had befall them. But, but nobody believed me. But even though a curse should have occurred, nothing happened. Even after the violent explosion of emotion, nothing happened, so I, I thought I'd substitute for the curse. I thought if I did it, people would change their minds and apologize to the spirit of the shrine. And she spat everything out in one breath and covered her face with both hands while lamenting aloud. Her sixth sense wasn't wrong. It could have been the real thing. He firmly understood the feeling of shock for the master of the shrine, but her sixth sense didn't understand the rest. By no means had she imagined that the master of the shrine was a cowardly child. One who had been hiding under the bed in the infirmary the entire time. Uh, that shrine was repaired by the school nurse. The master of the shrine was thrilled by this. He's far from cursing or getting angry, but if he knew his name was used to curse and injure somebody, I certainly think he'd be very sad. Not even angry, just be sad. It's Sokdaro, after all. So please, uh, stop your curse. The girls have already decided. I'm sure they'll gather everyone and apologize at the shrine. Believe in that and watch over them, please. Yes, yes. Uh, I'm really very sorry. Machiro continued crying. Her tears spilled out one by one. Acknowledging the feelings reflected in the teardrops, Marie was slightly relieved. Oh, the fact you were worried for the shrine made Sak Takanoshin-chan very happy. Oh, right. Takanoshin-chan's the master of the shrine. The next time, uh, please take a look at the shrine. If you go as you are now, you'll surely feel his joy. Uh, will I really feel it? Do, do I really have a sixth sense? You did? If I could feel the master of the shrine's real emotions, how do I know if I actually have the sixth sense? Well, you can see me, can't you? The very moment that Machira blinked, Maria's form had already disappeared. 
And Chiru surveyed the area around her, but she couldn't find her. Oh, there we go. Marie being so nice. Marie being, being nice to the Chuni and being like, Oh, whoa, you can totally see ghosts. Look, I made myself visible. And then doing a, van a, a Batman-style vanishing trick on her when she blinks. Nice. However, she was sure she heard it. She was certain she was able to hear it. She heard Marie's voice one last time. That fire extinguisher. Put it back where you found it, Marie. Yes. Oh, that was short. That was a short chapter. Oh my goodness. The chapter's actually over. Dude, that was like three scenes. I mean, it was nice, and it had an obvious solution from the start, so I see why you kept it short. It was actually a really good job in terms of uh, pacing. It didn't overstay its welcome. Like, your first guess, even though sometimes, like, your first guess being correct immediately is, uh, isn't, is always, it's not, isn't always, like, the most exciting, it's nice to sometimes get those guesses first try. And if, if it's like something that's obviously going to be solved, it's better you just don't make your story overstay its welcome, which he did a good job of here. Pacing seemed about right for like how short the story was and how easy it was to call the ending. The one thing I wasn't expecting was that it was Soktaro in the shrine. A nice callback to Umineko again. And yeah, the glossary should be accurate for this too. Chrysanth? Yep. Okay. Well, if it's gonna be that short. Ah, uh, yes, it wasn't Saktaro, it's Sakunoshin. Which is a completely different person, I, sh I assure you. Totally not a redraw of Saktaro's sprite in the new art style. Since that one was so damn short, we gotta do another one, right? We got time, let's dig in once more. Chapter 5. What's this? Hamelm's, Hamelm's Castanets? Hamelm's Castanets. Alright. Scenario 5. Or Chapter 5. If you would prefer. 8.50 a.m. So precise. Normally head, attending students would be headed straight for their classrooms. And until the start of the first bell, they'd strike up conversation with their fellow classmates. It was that time of day. However, at this hour, things were a little different today. Instead of a lot of students gathering to enter the school building, they gathered in front of the rabbit cages behind the building. Some were screaming, some, some stood dumbfounded, and some were vomiting in the nearby storm drain. The reactions to the spectacle that lay before them was of all varieties. However, if one carefully observes, they'd be able to tell that in the depths of their eyes, they all had the same look. The look of curiosity. For the male students who caught their breath and opened their eyes, they huddled with their friends, and even the girls who seemed about to cry were really thinking the same thing. This was somehow amazing. After all, this is the first time they'd seen such a cruel spectacle before. It wasn't in a dream, an anime, or even manga. It was the real world. Moreover, it was at the school they go to every day. Inside the pen, the bottom was a sea of dark red blood. Rabbits that have, that have had their ears torn apart, tails, front legs, back legs, all their organs from their torsos. Rabbits diced up with some kind of sharp instrument. Rabbits with their whole bodies turned purple from being beaten and their tiny limbs bent in impossible directions. They'd never seen just a gruesome scene more befitting of the word cruel. It's like a, a sociopathic 12-year-old went to town on some rabbits. Furthermore, regardless of how many rabbits were in that state, they were still alive. Uh, what? Blood flowing as they shivered, they let out shallow breaths. But there was no one among the students who could treat them. So they, like, cut off the ears of the rabbits? 
they like rip their, some of their limbs off, beat them up and slice them open. Damn, all right. But there was no one among the students who could treat them. Despite how young they were, they understood. No matter what kind of measures they took, these rabbits could not be saved. Rather, they realized if they saved the rabbits as they were, that would be even more cruel. Hearing the commotion, the teachers ran out of the staff room. Although they all too turned pale and were at a loss for words after taking a look at the rabbit pens, they managed to restore some order and directed the students to wait in the classrooms. However, even after the children, after the children had gone, the teachers didn't move for some time. They merely painfully continued to watch the massacred rabbits. And at that moment, they sensed that something moved from the corner of the pen. There was a hole the rabbits had dug, and from the inside, the head of one terrified rabbit looking at the scene popped out. Well, every cloud has a silver lining, apparently, one of the teachers muttered. And if, if that was their signal, one after another, rabbits began, began coming out of the hole. Although some were dragging their legs, none seemed to have any major injuries. The white rabbits moved around the sea of red blood, caught in the scene. Disconnected from reality, once again, the teachers were at a loss for words. However, the silence was abruptly cut short when one of the young teachers decided to ask a question. Timidly, timidly, though incredibly bluntly. Uh, did we really even keep this many rabbits in the pens? The live rabbits and rabbit corpses, their total numbers far exceeded the number of rabbits they all thought were in the cages. Nine twenty AM Imata, the person in charge of the classroom too, was headed for the classroom. He was thinking about how he should explain the rabbit pen incident to the student. And suddenly he recalls news he heard the other day. It took place at the elementary school in the neighboring town, and the news report was ha talking how they had to get rid of the animal pens due to budget cuts. It was to save on maintenance and food costs. And he remembered how cheap they seemed by robbing those children of the chance to pet and play with those animals. But now that he thinks about it, perhaps the talk about budget cuts was to save face. Perhaps it might have been to dress up an incident like this one. It's a dangerous age, the hearts of children are going wild. The idea that taking care of pets was part of a good education might already be a thing of the past. What will happen with those rabbit pens? Although many were left alive, it'd probably be hard to keep raising animals in those pens as they are now, so he thought. Even if all the bodies of the rabbits were gathered and all the vast amounts of blood washed away, that smell like rotten meat, that choking odor of iron probably wouldn't really go away. Well, there were only a few students who would go near the rabbit pens. It's not like rabbits are rare or anything like that, and the number of students who would go as far as to expressly ask to borrow the key to the pens in the staff room to pet them were almost zero. It was the same for Amata and the other teachers. They rarely even checked inside those pens. Just a student, one of our class's animal rearing committee members, they came to borrow a key. That ever expressionless kid. The boy with the top grades in his age bracket. I wonder if he was among that group of kids circling the rabbit pens now. If he was there, it must have given him quite a shock. Finally arriving at the classroom, Imata came to a stop. From inside the classroom, he could hear a crowd of students making loud conversation. Seriously, it was awesome! That blood! was spewing everywhere. As he listened to the excited voices of the students talking, Imata let out a sigh. Before long, the police should come. He doesn't know what level of assistance he can provide, but the news might leak onto the television. The local newspaper will likely pick up on it, and the PTA should open up an emergency meeting. <sighs> Had nothing but problems like these since yesterday. Yesterday, some students in Imata's class were unaccounted for. Even worse, four students at the same time. He got word of that from several parents after it had gotten late at night and their children hadn't come home from school yet. Normally it wasn't uncommon for students to skip school. And if for some reason those students were a particularly ill-mannered bunch, so Imata wasn't honestly that worried about them. However, when they still weren't found a day later, he c couldn't remain optimistic. <sighs> Imata let out another heavy sigh and opened the classroom door. The students stopped chatting and all at once turned to face his way. He met eyes with the students sitting in the front row, an animal raising committee member who went to the rabbit pens every day. 
Hikaru Nihei was as expressionless as always. Once again, Imata looked over the client's room. He's wearing a Where's Waldo t-shirt with an emo haircut. All right. One, two, three, four. It might have been hidden under the shadow of the rabbit incident, but since yesterday, the missing student seats still dotted the classroom. Empty. Hikaru Nihei was appropriately expressionless. A very quiet student. However, looking at him in this class, it wasn't his that his personality was quiet, but he didn't have classmates to talk to, or so it seemed. He didn't have anyone to talk to. In other words, he had no friends. They say you can hear it from the former school building girl's bathroom. A girl's voice would say, SMS, SMS, you there? Please listen to my pitiful story. It, it's not a guy? I heard someone say, they heard a guy screaming and shouting. As I was saying, that's the voice of the teacher who was killed by Mesa Mesa San's curse. After returning to their homeroom, his classmates were talking in the corner of the room. Even though they were sitting right next to him, there was no sign at all of him getting into the conversation. They wouldn't even let him enter their gaze. They completely ignored Hikaru's existence. The kind of guy... That kind of guy wasn't there from the beginning. It was that kind of attitude. Hikaru wanted to quickly leave the classroom. I mean, school was already over. Staying around people who acted like he didn't exist was only agonizing. However, when Hikaru decided to go home, he noticed his bag was extremely light. Even though he should have had his notebook and textbook since the beginning of homeroom period, Looking through his desk and locker, his classmates, who'd been completely ignoring Hikaru until moments ago, suddenly stopped talking, and he caught sight of them grinning his way. Not again. Thinking so, he went to look in the garbage can, and as he thought, Hikaru's class materials had all been thrown inside. He carefully moved the leftover milks that covered them. They were soaking wet and thickly soiled, recognizing these were his things with his name written on them. That alone was painful. He could make use of the textbook, but he probably had to throw away the notebook. Even though he'd just gotten it exchanged last week for the same reason. A feeling of frustration and shame that couldn't be put into words welled in his heart, but for an instant his vision blurred. As Hikaru held his head in shame, he didn't raise his face for some time. He felt his classmates staring at him. Keeping his posture, he took a deep breath, bit his upper lip, and made his usual expressionless face. With that, he took up his textbook from the garbage can, stuffed that milk-stained textbook in his bag. He probably wouldn't open the bag until he got home. He didn't want anyone to see him pathetically cleaning and drawing out his textbook at school. He left the classroom as if he were running away from that scenario. As he shut the door, he heard a grandiose, vulgar laughter. Hikaru once again bit his lower lip and turned away from the classroom and walks off. He wanted to quickly head to the rabbit pens. In this school, Hikaru's unique place to go to forget his worries was with the rabbits. Thanks for waiting. How have you all been? While opening the door to their cage, Hikaru spoke to them. Faith, which had been expressionless until now, was filled with such spirit it was hard to believe. His voice also seemed to become extremely good-humored. He tossed the bag he'd been burdened with towards the corner of the cage. Along with a thud, the dried earth whirled up. Whether they reacted to the sound or not, the rabbits that had hidden in holes poked their faces out. Large red eyes. Ears that stood up straight. Those adorable gestures. Their bodies had been dirtied here and there, but if one wiped it away a little, they'd become snow white. Hikaru was a member of the Animal Raising Committee. Last two's committee had been assigned to taking care of the rabbit cages. They had to feed them each day, and twice a week they have to clean the cage. Compared to the other members and those involved, it was quite a difficult task, so it had, it had been a position everyone distanced themselves from. From the start of this semester, Hikaru had been forced into this role by the rest of his classmates. Yeah, rabbits. That seems like a real pain to take care of if it's like 20 rabbits or something. You'd probably have to... Yeah, you'd have to thoroughly clean that pen. There'd be crap everywhere. In the end, he thought it was good. Had he not met these rabbits, Hikaru's school life would truly have been the lowest of the low. It was ruined again. My notebook. He held his hand out to the rabbit, softly petting it. The texture of its soft, 
uh, short fur was pleasant to the touch. Not all that expensive, but if it's constantly getting thrown away, I wonder if it'd be better to not just to just not take notes in class anymore. Right. Don't touch the Pecora. Yeah. Even if he doesn't bring his notebook, he can still get a good score on his tests. Hikaru is smart. He was smarter than anyone else in the class. His classmates also knew this. Hikaru Nihei was quiet and smart. That made them jealous. So he was bullied. Outrageous, isn't it? How long had it been since Hikaru's possessions started being thrown away? Was it because he received 100% in all his classes and was praised by his teachers? Was it because he kindly taught everyone his trick to taking notes? He didn't know what the cause was, or if it was an accumulation of everything. In any case, one day it seemed that Hikaru had been badmouthed as being full of himself, and finally when he moved on to ignoring it, turned to having his personal items thrown into the garbage bin. Why me? He muttered this to himself, and Hikaru reached out his hand to a nearby rabbit, softly hugging it. It was soft and warm. He wanted to feel that body warmth more, so he put more strength into the arm that was holding it. The warmth transmitted through his arms was enough to melt his heart. Why does this happen to me? He used even more strength and more strength and more. A strange sound escaped from the rabbit's mouth. By now, the rabbit in Hikaru's arms looked to be in agonizing pain as it struggled. But Hikaru didn't make to let go. He stared at the rabbit's squirming state, putting more power from his entire body into strangling. The rabbit's neck droned and shook with gray figure, and the ears that stood up straight hit Hikaru's face. He glared at the rabbit. Then, raising with one rab raising the rabbit with one hand as high as he could, he threw it towards the other rabbits that had huddled together in the corner. The thrown rabbit went face up, limp, and the other rabbits became panicked and fled around the cage. Oh, come on. Don't act like you're dead now. You should be used to this much, right? It's okay. Animals won't die with just that. He's been doing it every day. He understood perfectly to what extent they're able to withstand. As he kicked, p kicked up the fallen rabbit with the tip of his shoe, Hikaru felt grateful. Thank goodness the rabbits are here. Thank goodness I became a member of the Animal Raising Committee. If I didn't have the time to play with you guys, I don't know what would happen to me during the days of being bullied. The rabbit, who could barely even stand, went to hide in a hole. However, like an eagle, Hikaru caught its back leg and casually dragged it back. The rabbit managed to get away again and tried to crawl into the hole again. But just as it was about to reach the hole, it was pulled back again. It repeated many times. Those guys just don't hit me. Twisting its back leg and pulling it towards him again, Hikaru murmured with his expressionless face. They throw away my school supplies. They hide my shoes. They tear up my gym uniform. They force me to do all the work during classroom cleaning duty. I'm totally fine with it. But they still haven't punched me or kicked me. They don't hit him. They don't kick him. They don't leave any marks. Hikaru hated this from the bottom of his heart. If Hikaru were to commit suicide, surely they'd all say this. But we didn't bully him or anything. We never once laid a finger on him. Not once. Not even once. Don't fuck with me. To them, they might not have really felt like they were bullying Hikaru. And if that was the case, I couldn't forgive them. Try hitting me. Try kicking me. You know? You know that feeling of having your things gone over and over? The feeling of making excuses to your parents when your shoes disappear? Since it's not physical violence, I can't tell anyone. Because they'll say it didn't happen if I don't have a scratch on me. They should hit me. Knock out my teeth. Break my jaw. I want them to beat me until I can make someone recognize how much they've hurt me. I said hit me, damn it. He spat out and threw the rabbit he held against the wire screen. Although the loud crashing sound didn't divert his thoughts, Hikaru understood. He was bullying these rabbits. He was abusing tiny animals that couldn't fight back. They could only cry each and every day. He was doing something cruel, and he knew that well, but those cruel things felt irresistibly soothing. He readily accepted and felt it. Once again, Hikaru put out his hand to take up another rabbit. Hello. Having suddenly heard a voice, Hikaru looked back with a jump. When he looked on the other side of the rabbit pen wire stood a small girl wearing glasses. Did she see me? My amusement with the rabbits? My moment of bliss? Speaking of, who is this girl? Hurry up and disappear. Perhaps those emotions welled up inside Hikaru's eyes. The girl shriveled. 
Sorry. For suddenly speaking like that and scaring me. Saying that, she smiled as if to smooth things over. When did she get here? When Ikaru was playing with the rabbits in the pen, he was always cautious of whether or not someone was coming. The inside of the rabbit pens looks over the school entrance, the courtyard, everything. If someone were to come near the rabbit pens, he'd quickly notice. However, he hadn't noticed her approach until this very second. Ikaru stood as if to hide the rabbits from her gaze. Need something. He kept his expressionless demeanor from dissolving with his question, but his heart was beating fairly rapidly. He might have seen him having fun with the rabbits. Hikaru tried looking over the girl again. Simple, inconspicuous facial features. Despite being in the same class, she seemed like a girl whose name would be forgotten. A girl with an air of absent-mindedness about her. He didn't even have confidence this was the first time he'd met her or not. Supposing they spoke before, he probably wouldn't remember. That's how thin her presence felt. It's rare for someone to come to these rabbit pens. Seems a lot of people don't even know there's rabbit pens here either. It seemed, she seemed like a girl who had discovered someone's shadow by the rabbit pens and decided to approach them. Guessing as much for now, Hikaru took a breath. Didn't seem as if she saw how he was behaving moments ago. The relief might have been a wrong guess that left him with his guard down. Forcing a smile to her face, the girl comes into the pen. He didn't know who she was, but stepping foot inside his sanctuary was something he couldn't allow. Furthermore, if I goof up, she'll probably timidly come this way tomorrow too. Don't fuck with me. This sanctuary is mine alone. This isn't a place for someone like you. From the looks of it, it has no one else but rabbits or friends who just nonchalantly come in. There was no way for the girl to tell these were Hikaru's feelings. Squatting down, she began petting one of the rabbits happily. Oh, don't be afraid. They're really cute. It's fine if you pet them as you like, but don't come here again. He just sent those feelings, but there was no way they'd reach. As Hikaru began to feel his stomach churn a bit, he glared at her back as if she were about to bite into he were about to bite into it. Huh? Is this one hurt? Don't touch that rabbit! The moment the girl noticed the rabbit was injured, Hikaru grabbed the back of her collar and pulled her down. With a sudden violence, the face of the scarred girl matched the expression of the rabbits, adding to his explosion of emotion. Get it. No one's allowed here apart from Class 2's Animal Raising Committee. Don't go back again. Get out. The girl's eyes darted about in fear. Did she make some kind of mistake? Her face seemed to ask as if she couldn't understand. You didn't do anything wrong, not a thing. I'll forgive you, so leave, and don't come near my sanctuary again. Sorry, I'm sorry. Did I do something? If I did something wrong, I'm sorry. The girl shows me her nervous, frightened pupils. She moans to escape my hand. With that, she seemed like one of the rabbits. She became extremely annoying. The hell is it with you? Coming to a place like this by yourself? You have no friends? You're probably some loner who gets bullied in class. As he showed it full of emotion, his self-wounding words hurt even his ears. However, to the girl, those words cut right to the point. Her expression limply twisted from shock to sorrow. How did he know the secret? I've been hiding about being bullied. She had to have been asking that herself. It's unfortunate. I understand it well. Though I, we both hate the feeling. That twisted expression, it pisses me off. Hurry up and get out of here, ugly. Knowing that humans can't be your companions, you thought animals could be your companions instead? Your miserable thoughts are all too obvious. I know it. You're a bullied kid, right? Frustrating, isn't it? You can't do anything about it, can you? You think you can make friends with animals? As if rabbits or anyone would be friends with some bitch like you? Fuck off and don't go back. Hey, hey. I'm not adding that dialogue. That is verbatim what he said. He takes up a dirt rock and throws it violently. Huh? There was no one there. When he was grabbing the clump of dirt from the ground, he had only taken his eyes off her for an instant. Even so, from the edge of that single instant, the girl had disappeared. He looked around, but she wasn't anywhere to be seen. There was nowhere she could have hidden, either. She, she literally vanished like mist. What's this? Almost like... A ghost? It couldn't be. A, a yokai? It's like that for every school, but this school also has its seven mysteries, or rather, lately, eight mysteries. Or so they say. In one of those stories, a student playing by himself started talking to one and was demoned away. 
Wasn't there a story like that mixed up in there? The girl who should have been in front of me disappeared in an instant. Oh, that, that was all it was. Hikaru's back was drenched in cold sweat. No way. <laughs> Yoka don't exist. Hikaru wipes the dirty hand that held the clump of dirt. Well, that ruined the fun. I'll go back today. Or so he thought, and put a hand on the entry gate. And that was the moment. Don't say such loathsome thing. Hearing a voice suddenly behind him without thinking, Hikaru let loose a scream. Turning around, there was a strangely dressed tall man standing there. Yokai don't exist. If a yokai heard something like that, it would definitely hurt. You're well acquainted with the pain of having your existence denied, aren't you? This time, in an instant, someone was behind me. I was beyond frightened. I was dumbfounded. The young man had a distinctly handsome face, and his skin seemed transparently white. Oh boy, we're meeting a new yokai. This is going to be fun. He might resemble one of those pop idol girls making a fuss. Oh, that girls are making a fuss over these days. Really? His appearance greatly clashed with this dirty rabbit cage. Hikaru felt he was transported suddenly from a scene of everyday life into a fictional movie. What? So you think... So you can make that kind of surprise face too? It's much better than your usual... No. Mask-like face. Hikaru Niheku. How do you know my name? I've taken to watching you here for some time. You didn't notice me? Hikaru flushed bright red. That probably meant he knew what Takaru had done to the rabbits. Of course I know. That's how you play with those l these little ones. The young man spoke, and then his mouth changed into an impish smile. I, I was seen. Even though I planned cautiously not to be found here. What in the world did he intend to do? Talk to the teachers? Tell my parents? M maybe even the police? Oh, don't worry. I wouldn't do something like that. The youth laughed without a care. Really? He, he really won't tell anyone? I promise. It is really honestly okay to have faith in these words? Is it really? Hikaru suddenly felt uncomfortable and held his tongue. Did I just subconsciously say what I was thinking? No, I didn't. Yet he is replying to the words in my mind. Hikaru's mouth became dry as though he were parched. Then what does that make this? The person read my thoughts? But that's ridiculous. If that were the case, he'd have to be a real... Yoka? The young man, as though anticipating it, spoke what Hikaru was thinking. Hikaru, you're rather smart, aren't you? You're quick to get to the right answer. Then Hikaru quickly formed a notion. In spite of the fact only a minuscule amount of time had passed since they met, he was able to accept the man in front of him was not any ordinary human. I don't know what he is, just that he is different from me. It's some sort of special existence. Hikaru sensed this feeling through his entire body. Right. In the first place, the moment Hikaru went to leave, he suddenly appeared behind Hikaru inside the rabbit cage. As long as one couldn't slip through the wire mesh for a normal human, that sort of thing is absolutely impossible. It helps that you understood so quickly. These days, there's plenty of children out there who start out denying us. They won't accept any proof we give them. Battler denying witches intensifies. Y okay, right? He asked in a nervous voice, which made the young man grin broadly as he replied. Hamlin. Hamlin. That's my name. Everyone wants to call me... Hamlin of the music room, though. No? The music room? You see over there? It's the classroom facing the rabbit cage. Always over there? Truth is, from that window, I've secretly spied on you coming here every day. Saying this, the young male call man called Hamlin. Hamlin? Presented his hand in front of Hikaru's eyes. The hand was grasping something. He seemed to put on an air of importance as he slowly spread his fingers. What is that? What he saw next were castanets. Have you heard the ghost story called Hammond's Castanets? I'm not well versed in that sort of thing. Perhaps it might be one of the school's eight mysteries? Oh, mine's not one of the eight yet. Castanets are, uh... Uh, crap. Are they one-handed or two-handed clackers? I 
Oh, I know what they make. I know what kind of noise a castanet makes. I'm pretty sure it's like a clacking sound, right? It's like a clicking or clacking sound that castanets make. But not one of the eight yet? After all, it hasn't been very long since I came to this school. Yes, it's unfortunate. It seems I'm still but a nameless ghost story. I'm Elm's cast in it. I haven't heard of that ghost story. But my story goes like this. At night, if you're in the music room, you can hear the sound of castanets go click, click, click. But if you look around, there's nobody there. Click, click, click sound gradually becomes louder, and that's when you notice. Your form has become that of a small rat while you were, while you were unaware. They say that click click clicking sound was really the sound of your mousy teeth clicking together all along. And then before you know it, a man stands in the music room holding castanets. He calls himself Hamel. Hamel. Then the children, who turned into rats, seem to disappear into darkness guided by the sound of Hamel's beating castanets. And that's the kind of store it is. I'd love it if you'd spread it around. That's the first time I've heard it. I haven't even heard it from my rumor-loving classmates when they talk. Well, I told you, didn't I? I haven't been here long, but in that time, even if they don't like it, everyone's gossiping about it. You've gotten to the point of becoming this school's local special speciality. Uh, is there something you want from me, Hamon san Hamon san what could a dangerous yokai who turns his victims into rats want with me? He couldn't be planning on turning me into a rat. Oh no, you don't need to be so on guard. After all, I came to help you. Help? Me? Yes, Hikaru-kun. How long do you plan on letting out your anger on rabbits like this? The mountain smiled as he looked at the frightened rabbits all huddled in the corner of the wire mesh. It's called animal abuse, right? It's a particularly cruel sort of thing to torture these innocent rabbits. Being told that I'm unable to retort. Yeah, good luck with that, man. If a weak person like me is persecuted as allotted by society, then a weak creature like a rabbit should have some cur the same courtesy. These rabbits that are weaker than I am bear the duty of being tormented the same as I am. And I have that right? That's what I thought. But in the end, that's just a rule I made up. These rabbits are innocent. There's no reason why they should be tormented by me. Regardless of whether these rabbits have responsibility, torturing something that's innocent... Isn't that just ridiculous? That's right. Saying it's all because I was abused was no excuse for abusing these weak creatures. Is he going to be offering them as a offering to Hamel? Hamelin? Whatever his name is. I think somewhere in my heart I realize that. But then, where am I supposed to let out all of my sadness and anger? These days it's been all kinds of dangerous. Things like animal abuse would cause a huge stir with the newspapers and police because my human self is being tortured. Since I can't blame anyone, I, I tortured rabbits and I'm being judged for it. This man charged me for abusing rabbits and sentenced me? <laughs> Suddenly, I'm about to look at, let out a pleasant laugh. Hikaru-kun, you don't listen to what people are saying, do you? Remember, I said I came to help. What's all this about being judged? <laughs> Could it be you think I'm a kind-hearted yokai who loves small animals? Is that wrong? Come on, laughed harder than ever, waving his hand dismissively at Hikaru. And at a range close enough to kiss, he peered into Hikaru's eyes. W what? Come on, Eyes were stunningly red. It was exactly like a rabbit's eyes. You're hurting. You're hurting from the bottom of your heart due to poor treatment from your classmates. You may do with a temporary solution of striking these rabbits, unrelated to the matter, but your pain couldn't be healed. Am I wrong? And saying this, his gaze shifted from Hikaru to the school building. On the second floor hallway, he could see Hikaru's classmates who had earlier been in the classroom, probably having another worthless conversation. He could see them laughing with each other, gesturing exaggeratedly. And the moment he saw that, Hikaru understood what made his blood rise to a boil. That's right, I'm in pain and suffering, but those guys are. You know, Hikaru. Well, castanets can change things into more than just rats. 
As long as it's a small animal, it can change them into, well, anything. Elm placed his mouth near Hikaru's ear and whispered this softly. I didn't come to tell you that torturing rabbits is wrong. If they're innocent, at least. But if they're full of sin, it might be more reasonable. That's what I wanted to tell you. Sinful? Rabbits? Rabbits truly burdened with sins. That, that could heal all your wounds. If you do to these sorts of rabbits as you've done before, can't these wounds that have opened in your heart finally be sewn shut? Interesting. Alright, let's try heading to the old school's toilets. Fine, let's go back. They say the eighth mystery is just a rumor after all. Okay, so that so as I said, he's gonna offer them to Hamelin. Or Hamelin? There's no Y in Hamelin, right? Or like, I would say Hamelin, but it, there's no Y in it, so I'm not sure how to pronounce that part. Lin is L-Y-N. L-N is like... L? It's Lin? It's Om? Thinking to inspect the school's eighth mystery, they were rounding the rumored classrooms and halls, parading through the inside of the building. However, the school grounds are much larger than they thought. Even though they hadn't checked half the building, the sun was already setting in the interior, already covered in grid pattern shadows. Speaking of, normally, don't school ghost stories, don't they have seven mysteries? Why is it only our school that has eight? Well, isn't it because our school is crazy large? They say eight mysteries aren't even enough. I've heard we've got more than that, more stories than normal ghost schools. No, more ghost stories than normal schools. Making that sort of idle conversation, the boys sluggishly continued walking. At the end of the hall, from the shadow of the stairwell, suddenly they see someone's figure. Oh, what the hell, you? Didn't you cry and run home already? The figure was Hikaru Nihei. The boys had only just seen him head out the classroom like he was running away. However, now Hikaru said nothing, and with his expressionless face he glared, his eyes fixed on them. Uh, for some reason this guy's staring at us. What do you want? Don't tell me you want to play with us. Yeah, yeah, that's a bit much, even as a joke. I'd rather die than be friends with this guy. One of the boys showed an exaggerated grimace, and seeing that the others burst into laughter. Look, hurry up and go home. Otherwise, next time it won't be in the garbage, but we'll stuff your bag in the incinerator. The boys threatened, then they slowly began walking towards Akaru. But in the next instant, something hit the boys in their faces. Akaru had thrown something at them in a burst. It was rabbit feces. The boys might not have realized it was feces, but they clearly understood it was to provoke them. Hikaru glanced back at the dumbfounded boys as he raced off at full speed. Their feelings changed from astonishment to rage, and their ears flushed red. You bastard, don't fuck with us all! Wait up, dammit! I'm gonna kill you! They all gave chase after Hikaru. Wow, he's being really direct. I thought he'd just, like spread the rumor and get some randos killed, but or try to spread the rumor to them, see if they'd investigate and get them killed. But he's gone with a very different approach. J not telling them shit and just dragging them over there. Okay. Running up the hall, they fled down the third floor to the second, and they saw Hikaru, who was running in front of them, dive into a classroom on the first floor. Throwing open the door, the boys also ran inside. However, Hikaru wasn't inside the classroom. They wondered what he could be hiding under. Hey, come out! The boys shout with rage. That bastard, I'm gonna wring his neck! Even after doing what he did that one time, he still isn't sorry at all. The boys began searching inside the classroom. For some reason, the place seemed like the music room. The sun was setting, there weren't any lights on either, so it was very dim. Even the symbol of the music room, the grand piano, seemed like a large black animal in the twilight. Where in the world did he hide? I know he's here somewhere. Flush him out, then we'll cut him. At that moment, the sound of a click, click, click echoed through the music room. Quickly, they realized it was the familiar sound of a castanet. It, what's that noise? It's a castanet, isn't it? Oddly specific, considering most people wouldn't probably... I don't think most people would know the sound of a castanet immediately, but alright. The boys looked around them, but no one was there. They met the eyes of the portraits of the musicians on the wall, but there were no real human beings to be found. 
I vaguely know that that's the right sound, but that's only because the game's reminding me that it's called a castanet. The sound continued. Hey, stop messing around! Show yourself! Boys shout, but their voices oozed with fear. They thought it was reasonable it had to be Hikaru playing the castanets, but for moments ago they couldn't sense anyone else in the room but themselves. And yet the sound of the castanets continue. The sound of the castanets draws closer. Click, 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 click. The boys were panicking and they looked at each other's faces. It seems no one was hiding their fear any longer. Something's seriously wrong, right? What the hell's that sound? Where, where's it coming from? I mean, it's like right behind us. The boys realized the formless sound was coming up right behind them. And so timidly, fearfully, everyone turned around simultaneously. <laughs> There's nobody here. There was no one there. However, the boys were assaulted by a strange sensation. Something about what they were seeing was odd. They felt dizzy as things warped, and for some reason they felt the room was suddenly much larger. The ceiling above them looked bizarrely further away. Was the piano that large? These were so high their hands couldn't reach them. And the boys realized it wasn't that the room was larger. It was that they had become smaller. The panicked boys tried to cast their desperate scream, but their voices didn't come out. Why? And for some reason I can hear everything around me much better. What? Are my hands and legs always this short? At that moment they could hear someone's whisper-like voice right next to them. At night, if you're in the music room, you can hear the sound of the castanets going click, click, click. But if you look around, there's nobody there. Click, click. The sound gradually becomes louder, and that's when you notice. Your form has become that of a small rabbit. There was a strangely attired, long-haired young man standing there. In his hand were castanets. However, to the boys now, as they looked up at the young man, he seemed to have a stature like that of a giant. And they realized, they realized how small they had finally been reduced to. The young man put a smile on his elegant face, and then looking at the boys, you know the rabbits, he laughed. Congratulations! You're the first victims of my ghost story! Havels! Castanets! The young man even began to play the castanets to a rhythm. As if they were being manipulated by the sound, the rabbits formed a line. Well, it's time for the end of the story. Then the children turn into rats, seem to disappear into the darkness, guided by the sound of Havels beating castanets. Well, I'll guide you into the much awaited darkness. Sound of the castanets echo in the music room. When they came to, the rabbits realized they were in the rabbit cages behind the school. When he stopped playing his castanet, the rabbits could move freely by their own will. However, because the feelings of a rabbit's legs were different than a human's, they couldn't even walk properly. Well, Hikaru, the rest is up to you. At the signal of Hamel's relaxed voice, the rabbit cage door opened with a rusty screech. Rabbits opened their red eyes. In front of them stood Hikaru. Of course, as they looked up at him, he had the stature of a giant. And what he gripped in both hands, gave, he gave off a strange silver shine. In his arms, he held countless supplies. Scissors, drafting compasses, box cutters. They were reflecting the moonlight and giving off a cold metal shine. The rabbits had a feeling about what was going to happen, and they tried desperately to escape. But they couldn't cut through the wire mesh. Aside from escaping from a chance hole in the wire mesh, they can't escape. All they could do was run in circles, recklessly charging the walls, fencing only to bump their heads. Looking at them, they seemed pathetically foolish in their pointless resistance. Their claws would loosen and break against the wire mesh, here and there. Blood flowed from their head, buddy. And perhaps they'd given up as they huddled together and looked up as if to beg Hikaru. Please, please forgive us. Please save us. Please, we thank you. Hikaru looked at the rabbits, peered into the pupils of his detestable classmates, and a cheerful smile rose to his face. The heartless objects held tightly in both hands were many, but they all... All they did was express an inhuman gleam. Really, it's too cruel. I wonder what the hell is so fun about killing rabbits. 
I wonder if this could be the warning signs of some psycho killer. It's as freaky as hell. The four missing people they haven't been found, right? <laughs> school is creepy. At school, all anybody talked about now were the two incidents that occurred the other day. The mass killing in the rabbit cage and the four missing students. The area around the rabbit cage was closed off by no, tra no trespassing tape and nobody was allowed in. The police released a missing persons report for the missing students and the search was still continuing. But the four people would never be found. The only one who knew they would not be found was Sakaru. No, to say even though they were found, nobody realized it would be more accurate, but... There were many who doubted the two incidents were connected. Ah, yes. Ah, yes. Dead rabbits connected to disappearing people. There were also more perceptive people who seemed to realize the number of corpses in the rabbit cage was the same number as the uh, number of students missing. You think it was an advance notice of the crime that they'd kill four people? The teachers heard countless people whisper like that. What a muddled up tale. Nobody can understand that the dead bodies really were the four missing people. Nobody picked up. If one added the number of corpses to the number of rabbits in the cage, the number was higher than before. Rabbits have a strong instinct to reproduce and spread on their own while no one was paying attention. It seems that as far as anybody was thinking. For now, well, that was fine. As far as the rumors swelled. Yesterday, Hamelm said in the rabbit cage, it must work slowly to become a ghost story. At any rate, if I were to be well known too easily, everyone would get scared and nobody would go near the music room. There's still plenty of those that you want to get, even with, uh, even with other than these kids, right, Karuku? Become common talk, I'll turn all your colleagues you wish to kill. You, you wish to kill into rabbits? Ikaru nodded. That's right. It's not just them. Those bastards who ignored me. The ones who pretended not to see my persecution. Every one of Hikaru's classmates were his targets. And from here on out, rabbit corpses will be found all throughout the school. Only the same amount as the missing students. And in doing that, once word got out about the astound of the mysterious castanets coming from the music room, Amel's castanets will become a standard ghost story. Classmates who tortured me will be the victims of the tale, and I'll be the sole witness. That's right. They'll all be swallowed up by this sordid story and disappear. Would you say I'm a murderer? Apologies, but that's off the mark. I haven't killed anyone. I only kill immoral rabbits. Even in the worst case, that I caught, that I were caught by someone while killing them. Did anyone arrest me? Is there any law that makes killing rabbits a serious crime? In the case of animal cruelty, the worst they do is contact Child Consultation Center. My privacy and human rights would be perfectly protected. They'd even provide backup to seamlessly bring me into a healthy social life. There's nothing to be afraid of. And before long, Amel's castanets will become a true ghost story, one anyone would shiver to think about. The one who chooses the victims to this tale is me. Those who abuse me, guys I plain don't like, all will become rabbits by Hamel's power. <laughs> Seems to be in considerably good spirits. He suddenly heard a voice from behind him. He reflexively turned toward the voice and was astonished. Our girl, clad so extravagantly that it looked as though she'd slipped away from a play, was there. Skin so pale it would make one shudder and long, jet black hair in contrast. Does she really look that crazy? I don't actually know that she looks crazy. Maybe it's just the art style. But the description, clad so extravagantly it looked as though she'd slipped away from a play, doesn't quite apply to that outfit. A girl so beautiful it made him hesitate without thinking. Was she an upperclassman? Even knowing there were a lot of students in the school, he knew if a human like her were at the same school as him, he'd certainly remember her. You. You have an incredibly wicked laugh. It's the same kind of laugh as one of the school's yokai. <laughs> Hearing the word yokai startled Hikaru for a moment. Humans shouldn't be able to even appear to grasp anything about him out. His story is still far from finished. He has you in such high spirit. If you like, perhaps you could tell me. No, it's nothing. It's just I remembered something and it made me laugh. That's all. <laughs> even though there's been the missing children's case and the animal flag case today, it's rather imprudent of one of those... One to suddenly remember something and laugh in these circumstances. While saying this, she laughed too. 
It was a laugh so cold it made him shudder. A smile with such an icy gleam in her eye made him avert his eyes inadvertently. That's right. Even though such terrible things are happening. It's a joke. There's no tragedy. It's so terrible it can't be laughed at. One man's pain is another's pleasure. That sort of thing happens a lot. She passed her finger through her long hair, idly spinning it around the digit. Those detailed movements were excessively elegant in it, and made it look as though she were a very well-made doll. One man's pain is another's pleasure. In this school, that was something Ikaru usually felt. Being ignored, having his things thrown away, feeling awful every day, and yet, the more pain Hikaru was in, the louder his classmates' laughter would get. Of course, there's times when pleasure turns to disaster as well. <laughs> right. Right now, those classmates' pleasure turned to misery. The retribution for their deeds. They enjoyed my suffering, and now I can enjoy theirs. I'm not hurting them. I'm just killing a couple rabbits. They're simply being swallowed by Hamel's legacy. My hands are not stained with anyone's blood. He's being subtle. Perhaps too subtle for him. Hmm. So that's what you think. What are you talking about all of a sudden? Even though I don't believe what I said anything, she abruptly responded with, So that's what you think? This feeling, carrying a conversation when I haven't said anything, it, it can't be. Sometimes a powerless yokai will make a pawn out of a pitiless human. They can't hunt by their own power. So they tempt humans and use them. Truly a deplorable way to hunt. <laughs> what of it? I don't understand what you're saying. That's the sort of thing a human pawn would say. Someone without the bravery to do things by their own hands can indulge in a ghost story. That way their own hands don't get dirty. Without a doubt, that was Hikaru. Okay, he certainly knows he's... He's reading him like a book. Just like he thought this girl was the same as Hamel. She wasn't human. He's reading his thoughts. Oh, you don't seem to understand. You're killing. What do you mean by that? You know how ground meat is made? Don't tell me you think they mixed up some wheat flour and made beef. There's no way you'd believe that, right? Many kids these days say they didn't understand that animals were born for more than just to die for meat. Huh? It's not just meat. Death is being set on our dining tables. But we avert our eyes to that fact and we eat until we can't eat anymore. I mean, does anyone not acknowledge that meat is made from animals? We don't want to look at or even know that the very thing that brought forth to our uh, dining tables is death. I wonder how many of those children stuffing their faces with fried chicken have it in them to strangle a chicken to death with their own hands. Even though we look away from such a spectacle despite avoiding it, we still repeat our cycle of gluttony and overindulgence. I mean, that's just how it is, man. I don't have to even like that, but it's true. That's right. To eat meat is namely to tear off the flesh of the dead. Those who don't understand that sin don't have any right to eat meat. Are you trying to tell me I have no right to eat meat? I ask this of you who proudly said I have not stained my hands with anyone's blood. Who is meat do you have the right to partake in? Humans killing humans is awfully serious. I haven't killed any humans. <laughs> well, you eat fried chicken, you'd say you haven't killed a chicken? You couldn't respond. Who the hell is this girl? As he thought she's not human. Just then, the speaker installed in the hallway began broadcasting. Hikaru Nihei of class two, you're... There's three stars. Could be anything. You have a call for Mimata Sensei. Please come to the staff room. I repeat, Hikaru Nihei of class two, you're something or other. Sorry, I have to go. More than the feeling of concern I had for what the teacher wanted with me, the feeling of having an excuse to get away from this strange girl was much more potent. Later then. <laughs> Turning his back on the girl, Hikaru ran from there and headed towards the staff room. The girl threw some words at his back. If you have another chance to snatch away someone's life, consider chewing over how serious murder is. If you're not resolved and not prepared to bear the consequences, if you thought you could take someone's life without getting your hands dirty. You thought that. There's a chance that pleasure of yours might once again turn into tragedy, wouldn't you say? 
Well, at least she's at least she's threatening him and not telling him she'll straight up kill him right now, or you know, in the next five minutes. She's kind of just warning him off, killing it or getting anyone killed with Hamon. <laughs> Ikaru quickened his pace as if he were running from something. What is it? What's that girl talking about? I only just had a telepathic conversation with the somewhat strange, deranged upperclassman, that's all. Forget it. Forget about it. There's no way she could know that I've ki killed. However, the girl's words telling him to think about the seriousness of murder tormented him like a thorn he couldn't pull out of his chest. I mean, either she's trying to get him to kill himself because she's like, uh... She's like a yokai that drives people to suicide, or she's warning him off. It's hard to tell. He opens the staff room door. There were other teachers there aside from Imata sensei but they were all showing fatigued faces with low spirits. Among them, many seemed busy dealing with phone calls. They weren't just easing the minds of the missing children's parents, but they were constantly flooded with the concerned and complaining voices of other guardians. It also seemed they had to deal with answering questions from mass media, among other problems. Suddenly catching his eye in the corner of the staff room were the remaining live rabbits, or rather the real rabbits from the cages. A simple fort made for many stacked cardboard boxes. Newspapers were spread out inside, and the completed, that completed the temporary living space for the rabbits. It reminded him. He felt he had heard that after the incident they were temporarily moved to the staff room. After glancing at the rabbits without thought, Hikari went over to Imata sensei's chair. What is it, sensei? The teacher raised his head. As I thought, I can tell by his face he's tired. He might not have gotten much sleep either. Well? It's about this rabbit cage thing. My heart leapt out of my chest. There's no way he could know. There's no way he could know what I did in the rabbit cages. Must have been a shock since you cared so much for them. It's enough to make you sick, right? In an instant, Hikaru's defenses drop and his nerves melt away. Right, but of course. There's no way he'd been able to tell what I did. Yeah, but who else had keys to the cage? There's, like, a very short list of people who have access to the cage, and you're the one who's there every day. If there's no break into the cage, you're, like, number one suspect, my dude. It's truly cruel. I wonder how someone could do something like that. Hikari said without making any particular expression. At a time like this, it's best to keep a straight face. Afterwards, he'll leave it to Imata to figure out what that means. He must be hurting, or reality. He probably wants to cry and the like. The teacher's words were completely following Hikaru's hypothesis. Hikaru was holding back from bursting into laughter with everything he had. Well then, Nihei, this hasn't exactly been decided yet, but I think that rabbit cage is going to be removed before long. Is that so? This was also something Hikaru predicted. It didn't matter to him. It was a place that they let me utilize for my extreme recreation, but I no longer had any use for the real rabbits, no other cage. Because now, for me, well, for us, the school itself had become one giant rabbit cage. I know it's unfortunate for you, Nihei, but I think the sooner we get rid of the rabbit pens, the sooner the shocked children can forget what happened. They were killed so terribly like that? Well, that may be, but how do I put it? We teachers can't really explain it well either, you see. Explanation? What are you talking about? His teacher put his arms behind his head and groaned, staring up at the ceiling. The students in the lower grades, well... They're flooding their teachers with questions. Like, who the culprit is? No, that's not it. But why the rabbits were killed so monstrously like that? Children so young can't possibly understand why it happened. In other words, we can't explain to them what men of evil intent are. Men of evil intent? It said we were born with, we teachers are born with kind hearts as human beings, and we live and help one another. It's been said over and over for ages. To those very young children who've come to believe in that, they can't understand this evil intent that led someone to so gruesomely murder rabbits. But who and why would do something so this cruel? How can someone do something so brutal? Why, why, when they ask us these questions, even we teachers can't answer them. The irrationality of evil intent, not something even the teachers can answer. For young children passing their days happily surrounded by the love of their parents and the affection of their friends, it's too early for them to conceptualize the irrationality of evil intent. It's because some people are just assholes. It's the way it is, man. 
This world isn't just full of good people. There's bad people, too. And a lot of irrational evil intent that can't be understand, explained or understood. Even after becoming adults, they don't understand, and they have this thrust upon them. These children have a confrontation with something that's incomprehensibly terrifying. Many collapse from the terrible mental shock. I don't think that's how children respond. Uh, to, to the revelation of evil, but alright. Or amorality, or... Or immorality like that, but okay. I, I don't think I don't think small children just like you tell them about something you tell them about something that's like crazy, like like four dimensional objects or some cra or like some weird physics theory. Children don't just like pass out in shock. They certainly aren't gonna pass out from things like the existence of people who do things you believe are incomprehensibly evil for no reason, or like the lack of, or like casual mistreatment of animals, like there's no way they don't, like there's no way that uh, they just like pass from mental, sh pass out from mental shock. I mean, it's shit, but like, I don't see a six year old literally passing out from shock at that revelation, you know? In fact, I don't think I see anyone passing out from being told that sometimes people do things that, obviously from your perspective, are evil for no reason. Um, or ir irrational evil. The concept of irrational evil probably not going to make anyone pass out, regardless of age. Uh, more likely they just don't understand it or you can't adequately explain it, right? So here they're like, why? And it's like, well, because. There's tons of reasons. It's like, okay. You know, the obvious one. We could use our character here, where it's like, he's being bullied, so he bullies someone weaker than him. In this case, it's the rabbits. I mean, is that too crazy? It seems believable. We're powerless. We can't even explain evil intent to these kids. Yeah. The lack of ability to explain stuff makes sense, though. Like, because kids, like, just keep asking why or why or why, and you're like, well, it, like, I can't explain every reason on the planet. But, I mean, you could do the same thing for good. I guess it's just, uh, good is taken for granted, or lawful is taken for granted, I guess, for some kid, for a lot of people, right? Hikaru is somewhat amazed. If this world is made of good and evil, then evil intent is a component that makes up half of it. Doesn't being unable to explain that basically mean you're unable to understand half the world? Even more, it means you actually can't explain the whole thing. Because if you can't explain evil, you can't explain good either. As good is diametrically opposed to evil, right? Something that is good cannot be bad. You could define evil as all the things that are not good. Or the source of a good intent. A bad intent would just be things that are not sources of good intents. Unless you want to say, say things are truly neutral. Interesting. Yeah, I'd say you're unable to explain most of the world. And you'd have some... Some philosopher sit down and try to explain this to like a six-year-old who probably can't grasp half the concepts they're trying to explain to him. I can see why that would be pretty stressful. And you wouldn't want to do it as a teacher. Because it's just too much. It's just too much. Though the, fa the, the funny thing is, right, the part where they collapse from terrible mental shock. You know, saying, I can't explain this to a six-year-old because they haven't experienced enough things to have... The ability to relate to it, or like I can't use the language I'd need to to define something in a way that would be meaningful to them, or thoroughly explain it to satisfy their curiosity? That one makes sense. It's just funny when they describe it as like making a small child collapse from mental shock. <laughs> Countless unreasonable evil intentions whirled around inside the classrooms. An outsider can't understand this pure, simple, and unreasonable evil intent. Unable to understand that, how dare they put themselves on the lectern. Oh, that's enough to talk about the rabbit cages. I have something else to talk about. Nihei, did you want to do a little something else? Yeah? 
again, we're changing the topic, but what could it be about? While scratching his head as if it's hard to talk about, the teacher had a smile that's hard to read. Just by looking at that, I could see this is going to be his real topic of concern. But would you mind getting along with the rest of your class a bit more? Hmm? Getting along? Is that directed at me? Not to my classmates that bully me? Didn't you throw away Kinoshita's notebook? I heard you said someone this stupid doesn't need something like this and threw it in the garbage in front of everyone. That Kinoshita kid came to us in tears. Furthermore, after that, didn't you distribute copies of your notes to everyone in class, saying notes should be done like this? If you want, use them for reference. What's he trying to say, I wonder? It seems like he's making me sound like a bad guy. I really did throw away Yuko Kinoshita's notebook, but that was because Yuko is a stupid girl who couldn't study, and because she didn't understand how to take efficient notes at all. Making a list of snippets written on the blackboard, and making a list of bold vocabulary written in the textbook, it was like a scribble book in crude. I mean, but those are her notes. I don't think you need to throw those out. It was much better to throw that crap away. Judging it to be so, Hikaru threw away Yuko's notebook as if doing her a favor. Of course, no matter how kind it might have been, Hikaru had no choice but to be condemned based on throwing a notebook away. After that, he thought clearly about Yuko, copied his notes, and brought them as example materials. Furthermore, since it's a good opportunity, he didn't just do it for Yuko, but made copies for the entire class. Silent Hill F. Just more Rika and Satoko. Even before half the characters in the new Silent Hill game Yukishi makes are literally just like alternate versions of his normal cat. <sighs> well, the upside, the, uh, there's one up, there, there's one difficulty though. As far as I know, Silent Hill is going to be 3D and not done in an anime style, so... Green hair as a natural color is less likely. <laughs> Green hair, actual natural purple hair, less likely. I mean, they might just change it to black hair. Who knows? A black, a dark haired girl and a blonde haired girl might show up in the new Silent Hill. That could be cool. Be close enough, right? We made copies of the notes for the whole class. Our classroom is called the worthless class by other classrooms because compared to other classes, our grades are extremely bad. Regardless of being top of his age grade and test scores, the class average is slumping. Hikaru always thought that was annoying. So this is something he was driven to do for the sake of the class and thinking for the good of everyone. Even so, he was condemned, told he was full of himself. And in Hikaru's mind, he remembered something one of his classmates said as he murdered... One of the classmates he murdered the other day said... I'll wring his neck. Even after doing what he did that one time, he still isn't sorry at all. What did he mean by sorry? Reina's hatchet is a hidden weapon. <laughs> I was doing Yuko Kinoshita a favor by throwing away her notes. Since you people don't like me throwing your notes away, it's bullying. After doing something unreasonable like that? How are you telling me to be sorry about? His teacher continued further with a lecturing tone. It's true you have good grades, but the smart ones don't do things like flaunting it in front of the other students. That's what I think. Hikaru's head suddenly froze over. This, what's my teacher, this bastard, really trying to say? You think I... What do you think? I don't really give a shit? If you were so incompetent in the first place, this class wouldn't be filled with idiots, would it? And since then, do you even know what I've been through? Despite not noticing these incidents of bullying in class at all? Despite not even looking? Furthermore, just by listening to Yuko Kinoshita's wailing, he feels like he understands the situation. What a stupid bastard. This guy just said he couldn't explain evil intentions to kids. Those words are just proof of this guy's incompetence. Who do you think killed the rabbits? Some degenerate in town? Some college student who snaps easily under stress? Wrong. It's me. The kid standing right in front of your eyes. And the ones who cornered me into doing this were the kids too. Children already understand malice. Every day they live with evil far more spectacularly than you do. Do you not understand that, you incompetent twin? 
I knew that you went almost every day to the rabbit pen. Since you are a member of the ra animal raising committee, it couldn't be that you said, yeah, sure, I'll do it. I always thought you were so admirable. I knew you were actually a kind person, you know? Car just a bit laughed. Surely you'd know I go by the rabbit cage. I can't borrow the key to get in unless I talk to you. That's all. You only handed it over to me for business. It's not like you were concerned about me, much less the rabbits. It, now you're saying such a far-fetched thing so well. You don't know I was actually what I was actually doing in these cages, do you? Is he speaking? There was evil intent there, too. You just didn't notice it. So, can you step up some more and make some friends, right? His expression as he peered at Hikaru's face was that of probing. I wanted to crush those eyes into a pulp. Yeah, so I'll try my best. I'm sorry for a lot of things. Hikaru's entirely half-hearted response still elicited a broad grin from the incompetent teacher. That's great! I thought you'd understand. He happily slapped my back. I wanted to rip that hand off with all my strength. Oh, right, right. Today I'm on night watch and I'll be at the school late. If after school you feel like seeing those rabbits, you can come here anytime. We don't know how long it'll be until you can see them again. Thank you so much. Imata-sensei. Seems like a waste to kill him. Let's see what Takaru thinks. I'm feeling like that's a hook for him killing, trying to kill the teacher. This kid is the kind of person on Twitter. <laughs> oh my god, that's a good reference. The kind of person on Twitter who tweets about how bad their life is because they can't listen to their favorite song for some reason and compare their own suffering to the holocaust victims yeah they're the person who feels like they're oppressed by basically nothing or they're just like pissed people don't worship at their feet like this this outrage over almost nothing i mean the people in it those four people in his class were treating him pretty atrociously, even for what he did. I mean, I think throwing away someone's notes is kind of a dick move, but, you know, if you if you want to think about it, he kind of did. He did at least kind of redeem himself by, like, turning around five minutes later and just copying out his notes for everyone in class. Which is, like, kind of, he delivered it in a really arrogant way, but at the very least, he's like, no, you're taking notes wrong, please do this. It's like, wow, you're a dick, but uh, I guess I have some notes at least. Like, sure. It, it's kind of like not as bad because they at least tried to fix it. But he probably does that shit more than those. Those were just the two examples were given. He probably does more than that. Yeah, absolutely. Those are just the two things. He's probably like super annoying to deal with. He's probably a super annoying to deal with person, but... Um... Yeah, I guess the kids were treating him kind of shitty. Of course, he'll hate him. Yeah, yeah. But that doesn't excuse them endlessly throwing his stuff, endlessly throwing his stuff out and treating him like, tre actively treating him like shit. But, you know, maybe that's just his perspective. We only have concrete facts to go on, so he can say they treat him poorly and endlessly throw his stuff away. And endlessly steal his stuff, but like... Mm. That, that's all we have that's concrete that they do. That's all we have that's concrete that they do. That I could say they're probably doing more than he did. We don't know how he twists the facts in his perspective. Correct. His, based on his perspective. And I think we like... I guess the last chapter kind of told you don't trust the, the narrator's viewpoint. So he might be lying. You might be lying. The last chapter did kind of tell us we shouldn't really be trusting the narrator's your point. But I think in this case, there's no magical bullshit going on. I mean, apart from, like, maybe the murders. And even those, that might actually be four murders and then four dead rabbits or some shit. Who knows? But I think, I think we can kind of take the things he said as facts. Because so far, the reveals were just the, thing, the reasoning behind why they did that. And they're things he even agreed with, right? So we might have more dumb shit he does. But we, yeah, we don't know what else he's done. We don't know what else he's done. We just know people are treating him poorly. Right? People are treating him exceptionally poorly and throwing his stuff out consistently. If he only threw stuff out once, eh, 
and replace the notes almost immediately. The notes themselves, not just the notebook, right? It's not as bad. Even if he's like an arrogant asshole. We'll see how this we'll see how this goes. I'm thinking he might just like flip out on the teacher who's like I mean you might say he's a the teacher's a dumbass, right? Like even if let's let's take everything the kid says at face value. Even based on the information we have, I mean I don't see the teacher being in the wrong. The teacher doesn't seem to know what's happening. And he's just going on his own perspective. You gotta have a bit of empathy for the teacher, right? From his perspective, it's like, okay, you did these two things and people don't seem to like you and you're not really making friends. Can you like work on that? Now the teacher, not really very useful. Telling someone do better isn't really handy. Honestly, it's like, can you try to make more friends? And you're like, bitch, what do you think I'm doing? Like, that's, pr that's pretty much going to be anyone's response if a teacher tells you that, right? Like, I don't think the teacher gave great advice. And the teacher is perhaps slightly clueless about what's going on. But Hikaru seems rightfully angry, but I don't know if he's the kind of person who's going to be so pissed he wants to actually kill that guy because he has the ability to do so now, right? Or at least he's he's been willing to do that. He's been willing to like sort of cross that line. He seems to be more aware that it's actually killing someone and is less uh, disassociated from it, right? So like the first time when he kind of like lured the four kids into the music room and got them turned into rabbits so he could kill them, you know, you could say he's like a little bit disassociated from the act of killing them because they're rabbits, right? You could say he's like a little bit disassociated and thinking about it. And then Higginbonner comes in and is like, yo, think about this. You know, you're kind of separating these two things. They're actually the same thing. So next time he does it, he's going to be thinking that he's killing someone. And he doesn't have the excuse of like disassociating the two concepts. Even though like you really shouldn't. I mean, you might, might very generously be able to think that... In his mind, this is like a different thing because they're presently a rabbit. We know Hagen, Bonna, and Marie exist to straighten up people with the most twisted lot and longest schemes ever. Yeah, absolutely. Right, they might be straightening people the fuck out and try or trying to fix him, which is why I think Hagen, Bonna is kind of giving him a warning. Rather, than, it's giving him a warning. She's like, yo, yo, stop this. Pay some attention. Like, maybe... She's, like, trying to be generous, right? Like, I don't know, it's weird, but it's like it's like she was being charitable, and she's like, maybe this kid's a fucking dumbass. Maybe he just disassociates these two things for some reason. And, like, considers, well, they're just rabbits now, and, you know, rabbits, hurting rabbits is sort of bad, but you're not killing a real person. And, you know, magic, uh, it's not real, so they might just be random rabbits. Like, maybe he's, like, coping super hard. And obviously she couldn't intervene to save them in the meantime, right? Or Marie couldn't intervene to save them beforehand, so. Megan Bon is more generous than other Ryukishi murder lollies. Yeah, she's surprisingly generous. I'm guessing Marie was kind of like, yo, 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 no, 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 no killing, no killing. And Hagen Bon is like, dude, I can totally lure this guy to kill himself. It'd be great. It'd be some funny shit. Yeah, Marie is way too kind. I think Marie is keeping her back. Or convincing her not to kill anyone and to just be chill. There's a chance this kid ends up getting killed by Higginbana or uh, anyway. When if he tries to kill the teacher, because he might be like that. He might he might be like you know on a bit of that power trip from having like you know realized he got like four people killed and is thinking like okay I can totally fuck this teacher up. He's gonna go. And would turn this into a big a huge clusterfuck. Han, you just exist. Oh, uh, yeah. That'd be fun. Featherine would just rewrite the story because this is boring. Actually, I don't mind the story. Uh, I think Featherine would just sit apart and see what happens. Yeah, this could be interesting. So I'm curious if he's going to try to kill the professor because he seems tilted, but it's like a moment. It would be like a momentary thing if he waited and realized or like used his empathy and realized this guy's kind of just like not aware of things. Because he's even pointed out in his own dialogue that he knows the teacher doesn't know things and has to make assumptions, right? The teacher doesn't know things and is working off of less information than he is. 
But it's whether or not you have the empathy to understand that someone working from different or less information from you can't come to the same conclusions as you. Ava Triche would give the dipshit more power? Of course, of course. But Ava Triche also uh, isn't necessarily real and is just a regular... Just, just, is just telling him to go kill people with his bare hands. <laughs> or a gun. Gun foo works, right? Alright, Hikaru leaves the staff room. And yes, there is no audio for this part. I didn't mute anything. He couldn't handle any more of that mockery of a meeting. At the same time, as he closed the door, he crouched down in the corridor, clenching his teeth. Because remember, the teacher gave the hook of he's staying late by himself, and if you want to talk to me to maybe get the, the key to the rabbit cage, you know, I'm always available. He did that thing, which is kind of like baiting the kid, right? At the point, one could hear a grating sound, he's grinding his teeth. Doing that, he desperately repressed a voice from bursting out. The incompetent, inept, clumsy dumbass of a teacher. It's because of that simple-minded dope. Because that simple-minded dope is our homeroom teacher. That our class is falling behind. I guess he has a bit more resentment for the teacher, too, because... Uh, class performance is somewhat relative or important in, in, the, in terms of... Uh, uh, social status in Japanese classrooms, I guess. I mean, there's like that's in the typical anime has that like ultra competitive shit going on, right? Or like every high school anime where like every student is literally ranked one to 10,000. And that's how they determine what's good and bad. And then there's like 50 million high school animes. Of, there's like at least a half dozen high school animes, but like people getting literally like crazy bullshit based on their performance and what class they're in. So, um, in terms of, I don't know if that's real, but in terms of anime tropes, it seems very irrelevant what class you're in, and that your class performs well. Don't actually know if that fucking matters. I mean, it didn't fucking matter in whatever high school I went to, but I also don't have actual rating systems. He's bet, yeah, he's blaming the teacher for other people being average, but I don't know if they're average or bad. Remember, he said that they, th other people said his class is the classroom for dumbasses. Or, like, the idiot class, because everyone in there is, like, fucking bad at school, so... He could be feeling something here, but I don't know how real that is. As, like, a concept in Japanese schools. I guess it would kind of work for, like, your typical anime class. But the weird thing is, in most animes, classes are, like, determined by your fucking scores. Like, oh yeah, I got like an everyone got a 98, go in class A. And you're like, alright, all the all the B students go in class C, and you're like, alright. You know, so it seems a bit weird for him to be like super obsessed with this, but I, you know, we don't know the classroom structure here. Maybe it's just randomly assigned and he's like tilted that his class is full of dumbasses. And maybe there's some reward for having like the best class or something that he's missing out on. That's a lot of assumptions to make though. That's a, that's a big assumption to make, is that, like, he's somehow suffering because his class isn't full of geniuses. I mean, if you're actually a genius, you should realize that people, on average, will be less intelligent than you, right? Right? Like, on average, people... Like, if you think you're more intelligent than other people, then everyone's gonna seem like a dumbass. But he's saying the class is behind, so it's just like a random distribution that ended up slightly worse. He didn't even realize I was meaninglessly being tormented. Hey, it seems like overkill, but it's not entirely meaningless. Yet he'd listen to some girl complain and go so far as to lecture me. I mean, that's what that's what usually happens when that's what usually happens when there's like some bullying going, kid. Like, uh, at, at best the teacher will at best the teacher will go talk to someone about something. If they suspect something, but nothing's gonna happen for a while. So we got around to it, like, three weeks later or whatever. <laughs> it seems to me the next rabbit has already been decided. In the hall with no one around, as though it were perfectly natural, the cool-faced Hamel, Hamel stood. Hikaru drew closer to Hamel as if to grab at him. Right now? Oh man, he's going for it. He's killing the teacher off right now. Mm -mm. 
I don't think you have a strong enough justification here. This guy doesn't have like a vendetta against you. This this is just like your average incompetent. If you, let's, let's assume he's a genius. Everyone's gonna be dumber than him if he's a genius. This guy this guy thinks really highly of himself. Let's say everyone's. If you're slightly above average intelligence, that means ev that more than half the planet is below you in intelligence. You should be able to recognize this and say, okay, this guy's frustrating, but he's maybe average. He's only, he, he's not as smart as me, therefore, if he doesn't come to the same conclusions, especially with less information, he's not a dumbass. He's just, he's just not as bright as I am, so maybe I should give him a pass. Even if you want to be really mean. This is this giving himself a high opinion of himself. He's like, hey, think about it for a second, man. But he's not being empathetic. That's the issue. He's not trying to look at the situation from anyone else's view. Which can be really frustrating. Really frustrating if you don't actively try to apply empathy to some people. Really easy to hate a lot of people. You also shouldn't try to kill anyone without at least thinking... Thinking it over for a night, unless it's an actual life or death situation. Come on, man. No big decisions. No big decisions without sleeping it over, if it's at all possible. This is casual murder. We don't need to- th we should at least think about murder. As you should probably have a completed philosophy for why someone should- Someone should be able to kill someone but not kill you. Not that this kid actually cares, but I think it's important to have that. I think it's important to have that if you ever want to kill someone. You need to have a reason why you can kill them and why someone shouldn't be able to kill you unless you don't care if someone kills you. It'd perfectly fit into an American school. Yes, if this was, it, if this was America and he didn't have the magic rabbit, it would be time to pull out your dad's, pull out your dad's, uh, machine, pull out your dad's assault rifle and go to town on people. Replace Hamill, yeah, replace Hamill with a gun, yeah. Turn that bastard into a rabbit, that brainless teacher in the staff room. Well, if it's your desire, I can turn any number of people into rabbits. However, I can't listen to your current request. Why? Have you forgotten? I'm Hamel of the mu music room, am I not? Oh, that's right. Through in the music room, I can turn anyone into a rabbit. But in any other location, people won't want to listen to my castanets. It's my policy to be connected with the music room at night. Well, then we're in luck. Today he said he'll be on duty. He should be here until late this night. And if I bring him to the music room? Then the story of Hamel's castanets go repeat once again. I'll turn any tens of hundreds of your enemies into rabbits if it's your desire. Ikari started thinking. It would be some time until the sun would set. Man, listen, li listening to Hikaru murdering people is kind of funny. Because uh, that's also the name of one of the more famous uh, English grandmasters for chess. Like, and he's just using the music room to murder people. You know, a couple days after I was watching him on YouTube. Not as good as Magnus Carlsen, but you know, no one is right now, so. If you get bored of watching Magnus, you can play- you watch someone else play chess. There's a few good GMs on YouTube, actually. It'd be some time until the sun would set. As long as Imato was staying until night, Hikaru could easily entice him into the music room. It's pretty far removed from that staff room until here. Calling him into the music room at night would be quite unnatural. Yeah, it's pretty strange. What are you doing in the abandoned schoolhouse that you're not allowed to be in in the first place? Mel must be a low-tier demon to not notice the intense staring of Hagen Bana. Yeah. Maybe Hagen Bana's hiding herself really well, or some shit. But most demons fucking flee, so maybe he's trying to like... Maybe he's like the ambitious type. 
where he's like, well, Higgin Bond is not going to stop me because I'm only able to do things thanks to this kid. So I'll just, uh, she, she, she's like, fuck it. Yeah, push. I mean, are you doing anything objectively wrong? Maybe. But it's this kid who makes all the decisions. I don't know how Higginbana's and Marie's logic works here. Whether they're, I mean, they might be trying to fix this kid who's probably going to go down some route and be a serial killer anyway. Some dark route and become a serial killer anyway. Maybe they're trying to avert him from that rather than stopping the person enabling him. He's new. Yeah, he said he was new. And he isn't a part of the legend yet, but he wants to be, right? So maybe this is his way of, like, as an existing yokai, getting onto the council. Maybe that's how yokai get onto the council in the first place, is they try to kill a bunch of people and become legendary. So maybe Higgin Bon is looking at this and she's like, it's just another ambitious yokai trying to make a name for himself. The thing is, this yokai can't kill people by himself. Someone has to actively assist him, and they might be looking at that and being like, okay, well, this guy is perfectly okay with murdering people, and that's a bigger problem, because he's going to be a problem outside the school, too, and we can't necessarily stop him if he leaves the school. Maybe they're, like, leaning in that direction? We'll see. Yeah, I worse to be told to hurry home for being in school when it's pitch black out. Yeah, even Marie can kill people herself, and she's a huge cinnamon bun. Yeah, exactly. All the all the big all the top eight school yokai can kill someone by themselves, no problem. Even the shadow second can kill someone by themselves. This guy, they, uh, the the Bada explicitly said could only kill other people, could only kill people with assistance. So he's like, not there yet. He's not reached that plateau. So maybe they're just saying, hey, look. The, pers the real problem is not that yokai kill people to stay alive or that this guy wants to become a big dog. It's that this, I think it's that this other person is enabling them and they're like, this is a bigger problem and there's nothing we should deal with. Because I mean, yokai gonna yokai. Yokai gonna kill people as long as they're not killing a billion people, we don't care. Right? So I think even Marie acknowledged that like yokai feed on souls so they kind of have to murder people. And it's only when they're like unreasonably killing people that it's kind of a problem. That's what it seems like it's so far. Oh, the static's getting to me. I gotta keep moving. <laughs> All this guy can do is seduce people into like at attempting to help him with murder. If nobody helps him, nobody dies, right? That's what it seems like. And he's in like a far removed location, the fucking music room, like music room in the abandoned building. You have to go there. And nobody has a reason to go there. And it's only at night. Like, he's got some pretty hardcore restrictions. Needs someone to bring them in. The like, he might even need them too, so. There might be something involved with, like, him leading them. Someone else leading them there too. Or he's actually not doing that. He may- well. The real illusion would be that the Hamelin's not real. And this kid's actually a serial killer. That would be pretty crazy. But then where did the four rabbits come from? <laughs> right. Yeah, worse to be told to hurry home for being in school when it's pitch black out. Hamelin has no intention of doing his work anywhere but the music room, so how would I lure my victim to the music room? How would I lure that incompetent teacher secluded in the staff room, probably writing logs, into the music room? Oh, I'm clever. Without breaking Hamelin's policy, how can I turn that teacher in the staff room into a rabbit? An idea flashed into my mind. I told him my idea, and he let out a happy voice. Haha, <laughs> you struck upon a really fun idea? If you do that, well, I'll have to lend you my powers. I knew I was right in choosing you as my partner. You really are a smart one, Hikaru-kun. Hearing that, Hikaru let out a satisfied smile. That's right, I really am smart. What's he gonna do, bring the music room to the teacher? It's after school. The sun will set before long, and until about the last minute the library room was about to close, Hikaru headed straight for the staff room. The school at night looked completely different than it did in the day. It wasn't just the lighting or the atmosphere that was different. It was as if each building had wandered into their own separate worlds. He walks quite quickly down the dim hallway. He can't hold back his need to hurry. As he was listening to the sound of the echoes, his own footsteps going tap, 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 Hikaru remembered whether or not he was properly prepared to take someone's life. You don't seem to understand that you're killing. Those were the words of the strange raven-haired girl. 
Tonight I will once again kill a single rabbit, and the teacher will be swallowed by Hamelin's ghost story and disappear. Er I asked Hamelin to turn him into a rabbit. That was the same as saying kill him. Someone without the bravery to do things by their own hands can indulge in a ghost story. That way their own hands don't get dirty. Are you calling me a coward? I think she is. Are you saying I don't know what it means to kill? Is that what you want to say? If humans are going to take human lives, that they need to be properly prepared and should be ready to endure the consequences? I'm not a coward. When I torture those bastards, those rabbits to death, it's because I don't want to treat them the same as human beings. It's not like I want to run away from the fact I'm killing people by killing rabbits or anything like that. Now he's just coping hard. Of course, he wants this because there's no... He thinks there's no uh, risk in this, right? He can turn people into rabbits and kill them, but he, only, he doesn't have to suffer the penalties of killing a person, right? That's what he's thinking. He is totally thinking that. That's why he's using the rabbit transformation thing. It ma makes him feel like it's perfectly safe and, nor and, and uh, reasonable to kill people. Basically, the only reason he isn't killing more people is because he has to turn them into rabbits first to not get caught. So he's certainly... Uh, that's certainly copium, this line. If you had a demon familiar, you'd prefer Ronove. Not even because he's a strong fighter, it's because he's a god-tier butler. Of course. Ronove is a good butler. Magic. Getting uh, every all your meals served to you without having to cook them yourself? Sounds amazing. He on demand? Lovely. I killed him without even treating them like humans. That's my way. Going beyond even murder. It's the ultimate revenge. That's right. And that's extremely important to me, indeed. And should I do something worthy of that revenge? Are you saying I don't understand what it means to kill? Well, I understand. I understand with all five senses what it means to kill. I've changed people into rabbits that can't even cry. I've had that feeling of stepping on their faces, the trembling cutting off their ears with scissors, the feedback when piercing their eyes with a drafting compass. I felt everything, and I understand. It was proof that I truly hated irrational evil intent. Or truly hated or had. I tr it was proof that I truly hated irrational evil intent. I had it. I had the right to feast. I'm charged with hatred and in the name of revenge I'm prepared to kill. Yeah, but what has this teacher done that's actually worthy of killing someone? Like I said, this guy doesn't seem to have a reasonable... This guy doesn't... Well, I mean he's a kid I guess. Doesn't have a reason why you would actually kill someone. Is that really so, I wonder? Suddenly I heard a laughing voice. It's her. The thing that took on an upperclassman's form, a yokai. She was waiting for me in the staff room. The vital Imata wasn't here. I wonder where he's wandered off to. Just in my way, I set him off to wander a bit. He won't come back for a while. <laughs> she talks like she just read my mind. Uh, just what are you? The words that finally escaped my mouth trembled and seemed pathetic even to me. <laughs> now that you mention it, I haven't given my name. But I'm sure it's a name you've heard before. <laughs> Excuse me, what are your intentions? School yokai of the third rank, dancing Higginbana senpai. I turned around to the voice in my back and suddenly Hamelin was standing there. Well, this is our prey. Imata sensei isn't your prey, is he? That's true, he's not my prey. Oh, then what is your business? At any rate, I am a powerless yokai. Unlike the 8th ranking yokai, I'm still a being whose story hasn't caught on in the minds of the students yet. I have no direct knowledge of all your comings and goings. Oh, well, jeez. I don't have a speck of interest in the hunt of a bottom tier yokai like you. But you've been a bit too flashy, you see. Why, that's surprising. The night's finally been died in darkness, and I just thought of doing my duty as a yokai. Yet, you find him being too flashy? Well, that's right. It's also our only duty. But we have unwritten rules, and I have my own unwritten rules. You've stepped a little over the line as a newcomer yokai, you know? Oh dear, oh dear. What have we done to upset you so? A newcomer being too flashy? Is that it? Oh. Oh, that's it. Someone with the status of a newcomer needs to learn a little respect. <laughs> I'm terribly sorry, senpai. By the way, up, come on. If you look at it this way, for a very long time, I've wanted to politely pay my respects. Uh-oh. I'm sorry to say this despite my social standing, but everyone in the eighth seats of the school yokai, aren't they a little... soft? Ah, uh, 
Me? Every one of the eight ranks. I've been watching this school under the cover of night for a long time. I've watched everyone hunt. They're quite reserved. They're weak. They're pitiful. <laughs> you sure can talk. Can't you, Mr. Underclass? Don't you shroud this school in the fear of darkness and drain it? You should have all the power to do that. You could even pretend there are accident sickness in the sword. All your hunts. How pathetic they are. Where did the hunt... Where did the respect and fear for the school yokai go to? Uh, it yeah, it seems like she might be doing that Uno reverse and just be like, well, you know what? Time to eat you, buddy. Even with eight ghost stories, I don't think you even scare these children at all. <laughs> and so, Samel, in order to restore fear back to the night of this school and its demons has stood up. What do you think? In a single hunt, the school is already being ruled by fear, and tonight, the number of victims shall increase once more. No, we'll have more and more victims. Exhausting the limits of Ikaru hatred, my music room will bring more victims one after another. Is it fun? Being with the yokai? Before too many days pass, this terror will not stop at this school. It will drive the entire city into the very depths of horror. And eventually the sound of castanets from the music room will be added to the palette of fear. And a new legend known as Hemel's castanets will be born. What do you think? What do you think? Rather than Mesa Mesa's unsatisfying tale about the victimization of a single teacher in a restroom. Mine will make a much more wonderful and terrifying story, don't you think? Honestly, I think the Castanets thing is pretty cringy. But, you know, I I'm willing to suspend my disbelief in how bad of a horror story it is uh, to just move on with my life and enjoy this story. Because, honestly, as, as dumb as his uh, horror story he's trying to pitch to me is, uh, the actual story is entertaining. <laughs> I don't know who you're trying to provoke. You intend to defeat Marie and take the 8th rank for yourself, right? Of course! Let's not forget the three yokai. The three yokai did not endorse Marie Moria for the 8th rank. Is a tale more terrifying than Marie's takeover? Yeah, why do you think Higginbottom thinks it's too flashy? Because it's hella cringe, exactly. Higginbottom knows what you're thinking. It's like, oh my god, castanets? Are you fucking serious? This guy's gonna try to make castanets scary. She just used different words. She's like, uh, I'm, it's like, this is the 80s. We don't have the word cringe yet. It's too, uh, flashy. Hmm. In our class, there are those who argue we should switch Marie out with a new eighth rank. You must have been invited by someone in that group to the school, am I right? Marie Moria isn't an appropriate yokai for this school. Make me the new eighth mystery of the school. Hamel in the music room. See, I told you this guy was hella ambitious. He wants to become one of the majors at the school. Hamel in the music room. Hamel's castanets. <laughs> this new tale will jump to the top of all eight stories. Note that the tale of Hamel's castanets has not actually spread to literally anybody in the school, as uh, there were no witnesses and no one spreading the rumors. I'll greatly expand my power from hunting, and before long I'll exterminate Meso Meso with true power, and then I'll become the true eighth mystery. Hamel, no, we will become a new school horror story. If anyone gets in our way, even if it's a yokai, we won't show them mercy. No matter how terrifying a yokai you might be, you're no match for us. Akaru is really going off the deep end here. No one can stand against Hamel's castanets. Akaru spat out a show of courage with everything he had. But Akaru, the rules for Hamel is that you have to be in the music room, and you're a long way from the music room. Literally anyone with a dangerous myth that doesn't involve the music room is probably scarier than you, because the second you're outside the music room, you're safe. <laughs> and then Higgin Bonna can stand it no longer. She just starts laughing. <laughs> Her laughter started off elegantly, and by the end of it, it turned into a laugh that shook everything in the staff room as if it were from the depths of hell. Hearing that for the first time, Hikaru began to tremble once more. Wanting to fight against it, he shouts. 
Hello? Uh, uh, Turn this bitch into a rabbit? Yes! Hamel's castanets! This isn't the music room, you know? <laughs> Higgin Bonnet threw back her hair and laughed. A tornado burst from her center, scattering paperwork, showing the must seem not unlike a blizzard from hell. Hamel, what are you doing? Hurry and turn her into a. Ah! The blizzard of dancing papers that was drawing a spiral in the middle of the staff room rushed at Hamel like a giant white serpent and wrapped around him, constricting him. Then Hamel turned himself into what seemed like a giant tiger formed from a large quantity of paper. A paper tiger? Things you don't want to be a metaphor for. With, with only his head peeking out, everything under his neck was completely constricted by the tremendous amount of paperwork. Someone under the title of Hamel in the music room picking a fight with I, the dancing Higginbana of the staff room? You cracked me up. Uh, uh, Hamel? Why don't you try worrying about yourself rather than others? Hikaru ni Higgin. Higginbana's ruthless eyes shot through Hikaru. Are you planning on sticking Hamel on me? And removing yourself from the situation? Try and ask Kamel to turn me into a rabbit. That is the same as you trying to kill me. If you try to kill me, you must be prepared to be killed. Uh, 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 if you're still like this, it seems you don't understand what it means to be killed. Did you properly listen to what I said? The meaning of killing? Having the resolution and bearing the consequences? Have you thought about it yet? Slowly, slowly, Higgin Bonnet drew nearer. Hikaru's legs were frozen as though stuck to the ground, surrounded in the commotion of a pure white paper maelstrom. Or maelstrom. In front of the yokai nearing every, nearing step by step, couldn't so much as fall on his backside. Right. You think you understand? Higgin Bonnet was perfectly reading Hikaru's mind. Once she'd come to Kikaru and read how prepared this particular murderer was, she sneered with laughter. I have the qualifications to eat. I have the resolution to kill, out of revenge and hatred. Hence, I truly understand with all five senses what it means to kill. Feeling of stepping on- oh, it's a- The feeling of stepping on a face, the trembling of cutting off ears with scissors, the moment of impact when you pierce eyes with the drafting compass. Yep, they were just going back through Kikaru's stuff. His thoughts? I felt everything and I understand. That's your resolve? That's how you understand killing? It's a pretty weak understanding. What are you saying you've experienced? Even though you can't even remember the actual feeling of tearing up a rabbit's flesh? What on earth are you saying like that? What experience? What kind of resolution is that? Her laugh and the whirlwind simultaneously became like a tempest. And as the commotion blew off and Hikaru swallowed, in that instant his world was wrapped in a silent darkness. He killed people, you know. Do you truly know what that means? Even though she should have been talking in front of his eyes, he heard Higginbana's voice from what seemed like somewhere far, far away. It was dreadfully quiet, fraught with distortion, and it changed to sound like it was from a synthesizer. Are we the witches observing this? Of course, of course. We're witches observing this fragment. His skin was covered in goosebumps, and he trembled with fear. Suddenly, Hikaru realized his right hand was clasping something. A stationary set. Scissors, a compass, a box cutter. Tools he'd executed the rabbits with. They shouldn't be here. I, I swear I threw them out. The day after I killed them all, I washed the, away the blood. I tossed them into the bin at the convenience store. Wh why? At that time, he sensed the smell of the earth, and mixed in was the stink of animals. Is this is Slowly, the pitch-black world faded away. The wind on his cheeks, open air, and the striking smell of animals. He was astonished by looking around the area. It wasn't the staff room they'd been in until now. The place surrounded by rusted-over wire mesh was the rabbit cage. It, it can't be. 
The rabbit's pen should be off limits, yet even the tape that should be around the cage wasn't there. Yeah, in the corner of the rabbit pen, he could sense the shadows of something. For an instant, he thought they were rabbits, but that was wrong. They were shadows far, far larger. What? Staring into the dim light, Akaru realized what their true forms were and nearly screamed. They were the classmates Akaru supposedly killed that night. <laughs> my, my, everybody. We mustn't be so restrained. To experience and understand killing, that's what you're prepared to experience when you commit murder, right? Thus, we must properly help you remember it one person at a time. Akaru finally began to realize what it was Hick and Bonham was trying to do from here on. That's right, this is the scene from your past. The scene of when you killed them that night. However, there's only one difference. That is, from here on, the ones you will slaughter will be not rabbits, but as they really are. Suddenly he remembered his classmates' names. Osamu Tabuchi, Shinichi Makishima, Yosuke Nishito, Shunsuke Nagashima. They crouched and groveled on the ground, begging for forgiveness with their eyes as and staring at Akaru from below. Their eyes were black. On that night, the eyes he saw were not a rabbit's red eyes, but the same black eyes as Akaru's. Come experience it now. You said it yourself. Experience it with all... What is? What was that last word? Five senses? Yes, five senses. I predicted that. I couldn't actually read that. Regardless of Akaru's will, his hand grasped the compass tightly. It was the same feeling as a marionette. Even though it was his own body, he couldn't fight against anything. Of course, this is a scene of the past. It's a scene that's already happened. Hikaru's body was only faithfully reproducing it. He pinned down Osamu Tabuchi's face. In class, he was known by his nickname, Tabuchin. And into that man's pleasing gaze, right in the middle, he thrust the needle of the compass deeply into his eyeball. A terrible scream was fired from Osamu Tabuchi's throat. It was a repulsive shriek to hear. Yet Ikaru could not forgive him, even if he plugged his ears. That's what it means to experience murder. The one who everyone called Tabuchin, Tabuchin, was now writhing about clutching his eye. Next, Ikaru went to cut off the fingers on Yosuke Nishito's right hand. His nickname was Nishiyan, a type who had many female friends. Cutting the fingers with a box cutter was a considerably laborious task. Yeah, that would take a while. Those are pretty sharp, and they'll easily cut skin. I don't know about bone, though. That's not gonna work. The blade was damaged by the viscous liquid, and each time he'd stubbornly draw it out, finally with a squeamish. With a squish, he'd lop it off. That squishy sensation as it was crept up Ikaru's back. Of course, on that evening, Ikaru was not satisfied with just one finger. Just like that, with the other fingers. Squish, squish, squish. Then I kicked Shinsuke Nagashima. Nagashima, I trampled him. His stomach, his back, his face. There was a soccer player with the same name as him, so he also liked soccer. So I treated him like a soccer ball. Even when his body turned purple, I kept trampling him. I kicked and trampled the nearly dead Shinsuke Nagashima's stomach. I repeated this over and over again, and finally I felt as though I broke through something with my legs. Every time I kicked his stomach, blub blub, a thick something came overflowing from his mouth. Makashima's nickname was Shinichan. I put scissors to Shinichan's ears. Snip, snip, snip. After one go of cutting, the blades of the scissors became worthless, so I violently grabbed the dangling ear that had been cut. And I ripped and tore it off. And on that night, I laughed, viewing the blood stained cage, thinking there would still be more executions to come. With a wicked grin, I convulsed with laughter. Is this it? My experience of murder? Just then, Hikaru was thrown down on the cold floor of the staff room. The confetti that had been flying wildly about until just moments ago, now on the floor. And he starts screaming. Here we go. While tumbling on the floor, Hikaru screamed as loud as his voice would allow. A shriek from the pit of his gut as if he'd lost his mind. Already now, his spirit seemed to be spoiled. The horrendous acts he performed with his own hands filled him with regret and he continued screaming like a beast. Soon that voice changed into an apology. I'm sorry! Whether those words were directed at the classmates he'd killed or the teacher he planned to kill, 
or even the rabbits he continued to abuse. Even Hikaru didn't know. Saying this, he didn't even think he'd be, he could be forgiven, he, but he wanted to say it. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. <sighs> his weeping at last made him vomit, to the point of thinking he were spitting out his own intestines, Hikaru continued throwing up. <laughs> You've gotten quite adorable. I apologize, but you seem to be apologizing to the wrong person. That's not enough to answer for your crimes, I'm afraid. Higginbana's expression warped into a wicked smirk. Ikaru will now truly realize how unfair he was for murder. As expected from Higginbana, senpai. Be able to break my adorable partner so easily. This isn't in the short manga of Higginbana. Oh, that's unfortunate. But that means you're getting new content, right? Makes me laugh. You'd play with such a stupid and delicate kid. Even though Hikaru was a perfect fit for my spiritual wavelength and was suitable as my limbs. Quite the menial task to find a child willing to become my pawn. Is that what you desire? I can rip and tear you to pieces right here. Higginbana's be bewitching smile was judging the restrained Hemo. Just then, with a ripping, crackling sound, a section of the documents that had been restraining Hemo was torn to pieces. The restraint on his right arm was destroyed. Oh my, you surprised me. I didn't think even one arm could escape my binding. Too much time has passed, Senpai. It seems the one who'll be ripped and torn to pieces will be you. In his hand was a castanet. Click. Click, click, clack, clack. And what kind of farce is this? This is the staff room. Your castanet's powers aren't supposed to manifest outside the music room, right? Correct, but now where do you think the room we're in is? It should be the staff room. <laughs> if you think that, why don't you look at the nameplate? <laughs> You're saying your pals will be shown by what looks like a joke? Quite the half-hearted yokai. From a crevice in the sliding door, Hagen Bonna could see the nameplate and she gave a bitter smile. Previously a nameplate that had read staff room had been hanging, but that inexplicably had changed to a sign that read music room. It was a Karagoon's idea. In case it were difficult to lure Imata Sensei, it be, should be enough to change the staff room into the music room. When Ikaru visited the staff room, he dismantled the sign from the music room and changed it out. According to that sign, this is the music room. It's my territory. I've become one with my adorable rabbits. Hamel's Castanet! Click, clack, clickety, clack, clickety, clack, clack, clack. The cursed Castanet's magic powers condensed around Higginbana. Just like Alice, who drank the shrinking potion, Higginbana's body shrank before their eyes. Finally, that form was completely changed to a rabbit with the same red eyes as her. At the same time, the restraints around Hamelm came apart and the bundle of documents crumpled down with a rustle. Hamelm's newly freed arms dangled heavily, and he gripped the rabbit Higginbana with one hand. Now that you're like this, the third rank dancing Higginbana senpai is ruined. Oh no, a person who's a small doll anyway is a small, yeah, right. You didn't realize this became the music room, and that was your downfall. He put even more power into squeezing the ears he picked her up by. Then as she groveled, he looked at Hikaru, who was covered in vomit, and smacked his lips. How oh, disappointing. Even though I found such a tractable human, it looks like I have no choice but to throw you out after you've been broken. That perfectly. So sorry, Hikaru-kun. <laughs> the words didn't reach Hikaru's ears. He was nauseous with what felt like vomit up to his head, and inside that... He was praying for somebody, anybody, to kill him. Very well then. Grant your wish to the utmost of my ability. It's my gratitude in regards to these results. If it weren't for your work, I wouldn't have been able to knock out Dancy and Higginbana Senpai. Thanks to you, I was able to claim the third ranked seat. While Hamel's smile became more and more wicked, he raised the rabbit Higginbana higher. I planned on releasing the rabbits from their cage, but what can I do with Higginbana Senpai? I don't know if you'll turn back to your original form when your power comes back. Why, well, you can't do a thing in this shabby form, I should for firmly finish you off. I'm not cruel like Hikaru. In just a word, I'm only going to swallow you and toss you into my stomach. Looking up at the rabbit Higginbana he'd lifted up, 
Melon's mouth burst open with a splitting sound. It became a huge mouth, able to easily swallow her from head to toe. I can't move my arms and legs. I, the dancing Higginbottom? Oh? Even as a rabbit, you're able to talk? I'm surprised. However, you're unable to do anything. You're right. The most I'm able to do is just move my mouth. Well then, at least allow me to hear your death scream. Oh well. Fare thee well, Higginbottom Senpai. Fare thee well. You think you've won? Against you? It's enough to just move my mouth. Well, open his hand. The rabbit leapt headlong into Hamel's open mouth. <laughs> For a moment, it was unknown whose scream it was. We got some more screams. The only thing that was certain was it was not Hagen Bonna's death scream. There was one long stream of fresh blood running from the wall of the staff room. It was a bizarre spectacle. A man whose mouth had opened wide to swallow the rabbit Higginbana. New track, by the way. I don't think we've heard this one before. Was convulsing with his eyes wide open. And groaning. From that mouth, a rabbit jumped out. It was dragging something out in its mouth. That was Hamel's tongue. Covered in fresh blood, the rabbit Higginbana sunk her teeth into Hamel's tongue and ripped it out along with her. Moreover, the only thing that could be called a tongue was the top portion of what Higginbana was holding. Along with his tongue were Hamel's inner organs writhing ominously. Hamel had his tongue, his intestines, everything torn out by Higginbana. Well, rip, her, rip him. Hamel's <sighs> eyes were wide and his entire body trembled violently. Saying you want to chase after Marie to become the 8th rank? Thank you try to knock me out to become third. <laughs> As to be expected from such a boastful man, your tongue was truly splendid. <laughs> Please tell me one last thing. Who called you to this school? Marie is my very important friend. I won't forgive anyone who would try to drag her away. Tell me the name. <sighs> it's impossible. You had your tongue and organs ripped out. You can't even satisfy me with a reply. Fare thee well, Hamel. Your story will never remain in this school. <laughs> a rip and a snap. Well, as a schlick, he's gone. In the shadow of a desk, a terrible sound came as fresh blood splattered out. And from there, Higginbonna slowly rose and showed herself. It was the look of a western doll, and Hamel was no longer anywhere. How unfortunate. Rabbits have quite a large appetite. Did you not know that? Higginbana laughed with an air of composure while staring at Takaru who was still on the floor. <laughs> Your face. It looks just like one half awake after a nightmare. But you know, a true nightmare has yet to begin. I'm the dancing Higginbana. I'm the third rank of the school yokai, and I'm a particularly cruel yokai. Do you think I'd overlook you and take my leave? What do you want? Do you think killing someone would be something you could fully experience just like that? What you actually experience is only the human side. What do you mean? That, that... Click. Those are the cash nets that Hamel had. Now in Higginbonna's hands. What's the matter? What are you so afraid of? This shouldn't mean anything outside the music room, right? Oh, oh. But now the staff room is a music room, isn't it? Music seems very loud right now. I'm just gonna turn it down again. <laughs> click, click, click. Understanding what Higginbonna was scheming, Hikaru understood the nightmare he'd had was only beginning. Hikaru only experienced what it felt to kill as a human. He hadn't experienced being killed as a rabbit. Oh, don't worry. Your soul isn't to my liking. That's why I won't take your life. That's why I won't allow you to experience being killed. What I'll allow you to experience is what's called torment. As Higginbana spoke, she grew large enough he had to look up to her. The desks became huge, exactly like a humongous building. And Higginbana suddenly grabbed the rabbit Hikaru and raised him up. Then he was taken to the corner of the staff room and it became the rabbit cage. 
where the remaining rabbit's cardboard home was. We had plenty of experience abusing rabbits. So this time, how will we let you experience the other side? Stop, please, for forgive me. I can't. Because I'm an exceptionally cruel yokai, but very well. Especially for you, I'll give you one chance. She raised up Rabbit Ikaru up above the real rabbits. Chance? That's right, a chance. What kind of chance? Apologize. I'm oh, sorry, it's my fault. Who are you apologizing? What for? Uh, Taken bonus on it. Taken Bonna released her hand and dropped the rabbit Ikaru on top of all the other rabbits. Wrong. Goodbye. Ikaru Nihei-kun. This way you'll stay with your beloved rabbits until you die. I don't know what zoo you'll be sent to, but hopefully it isn't with an ill-tempered animal raising committee member. <laughs> Wait! Ikaru pawed at the cardboard railing trying to get out, but in this rabbit's body it was impossible. <laughs> Hikaru's words gradually began to fade away. Rabbits cannot cry out. There's no way they can speak human words, but he still desperately continued to scream, Wait, it's Higgin' Bono. And at that time, he realized he felt the gaze of countless somethings. The owners of those gazes were rabbits. The rabbits Hikaru continued to abuse. Not a single one of them was stirring. They were motionless. Countless red eyes watching Hikaru. What's with these what's with these guys? Don't rabbits sometimes eat their own children? Should check that. Finally rabbits began to slowly step up to Hikaru. I should double check that. Yes. I think so. Yes. That is correct. Hamsters and mice do it? Yeah, rabbits do it too. Finally, the rabbits slowly began to take a step up to Hikaru, slowly, as though surrounding him. Hikaru attempted to back away, but was cornered in the corner of the cardboard. W what are these guys trying to do? In that time, Hick and Bana gave him an answer. <laughs> Everyone's welcoming you! Looks like they're excited, such a cute little guy like you has joined them. I excited? Did you know about rabbits? They'll copulate with the same sex as well. What? That, that's not... Hikaru's now large ears were being blown about by the feverish, enthusiastic breath of the rabbits. That's not how I expected this to go. Hikaru was frozen by those wide-open crimson eyes. I hear rabbits have quite a strong libido. What? It, I wasn't expecting this twist. Pig and Bono, what? I wonder if that's true. <laughs> Hick and Bonna disappeared into the darkness of the hallway along with a light laughter. The door to the staff room was thrown open, then closed on its own. And at the same time as that sound, the rabbits all simultaneously leapt upon Hikaru. Rabbits can't cry, they can't even scream. It's just like the torment Hikaru preferred of his own victims. Well, she said she wouldn't get him killed, and that he'd end up in a zoo. When the school had been completely enveloped in the darkness of the night, and silence dominated as though not a living soul were around, Higg and Bonnet's forum could be found gazing up at the large moon from the rooftop. If someone apologizes, you should forgive them, eh? Even though it wasn't as if she were asking anymore, Higg and Bonnet muttered this. Well... Why don't you try thinking it over in hell? After all, you went and ruined my clothes with your snot and tears. Higginbana laughed. The moon was a cruel white. There was no warmth and only the cold remained. The end. And here I thought they were just going to- I mean, she did say she wouldn't kill him. An interesting form of justice from Higginbana, but uh, understandable, I suppose. In some- in some way. Yep. Wasn't expecting to read a scene like that, but hey, alright. Like, I guess it's a new scene. I haven't read that one before. I already read uh, ReZero. With uh, the bunnies eating him repeatedly, so... This is the- this is the- this is the alternate take. An interesting an interesting, uh, bad end, I guess, for Hikaru's life. 
Yeah, we'll go with that end. And that was uh, Higginbana chapter, fi chapter 5, right? Yeah, we're on to chapter 6. That was Hamelin's Castanet. Hamelin's Castanets. And next will be One Girl's Day.